to the November 19th, 2019 City Council meeting. And um, so just um, a few items to just start out the meeting. Um, open comment is closed, um, closed four minutes ago. Um, so that's in accordance with our council rules. Um, tonight we have three public hearings. Our first public hearing is the mayor and mayor pro tem election. Our second public hearing is the 2020 regional, state, and federal policy agenda. And our third public hearing is the five-year update to the historic preservation plan. Um, we're going to add to the agenda item 7A, which is consideration of a motion to authorize the city attorney to file an amicus brief in the case of United States versus Sinning Smith. Um, do we have a motion to do that? So moved. Thank you, so um, we've just amended the agenda. So, roll call. I'm happy to take roll. Council Member Brockett. Present. Friend. Present. Joseph. Present. Nagel. Here. Swetlick. Here. Wallach. Present. Weaver. Here. Yates. Here. Young. Present. We have a quorum. Oh, a vote on the amended agenda? <laughs> so, so we need a vote on the amended agenda. That's not on the script, Annette. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, all in favor? All right, so we've amended the agenda. <laughs> so we will start out with um, public comment. All right, and um, each speaker will have two minutes. Um, and our first speaker is Valerie Sirachi, followed by Sarah Dawn Haynes, and um, then Lynn Siegel. <laughs> Go ahead. Awesome. Uh, I first wanna say congratulations to everyone that was sworn in earlier today. As a longtime Boulder resident, I was relieved to see both sides um, receive seats as well as Bob, my favorite independent. Um, sure, Lynn. Sure. I feel that after 22 years of watching and participating in local politics, this past election cycle was noticeably different, almost like watching progressive liberals versus progressive conservatives. And while there's always been, <clears throat> to some degree, an us versus them mentality in Boulder, what I witnessed over the past three months to me was more of a visible divide than I've seen before in my community. So let me start by saying that's not how I think of Boulder and that's not how I see the future of Boulder. I don't believe density, protected bike lanes, or caring about people without homes is a black and white, yes or no, or NIMBY versus YIMBY issue, nor do I believe anything ever gets solved by one side alone. <clears throat> what is wrong with me? Looking at the people in front of me right now, uh, that shows me that the rest of Boulder agrees. Again, I'm happy to invite new voices to city council, especially when the words affordable housing were brought up so, after, so often during your campaigns. As someone who relies upon it and continues to continue to live, work, and raise my children here, I'm excited to see it finally getting the attention it deserves. And as someone who sat on the BHP board for nine years, I also know there are many ways we've been able to help our communities of affordable housing because of our partnership with the city, as well as nonprofits, local businesses, and our neighborhoods. Because of these past successes, I'm even more excited to welcome more people to city council that want to work to find creative solutions for our affordable housing needs. There's so much more we can do together than separated, and housing and protecting our working class families through our affordable housing programs is crucial for a stable, healthy, inclusive, and diverse Boulder. So thank you for your support. Apologize for my shaky voice. <laughs> thank you, Valerie. Um, Sarah Don Haynes, Lynn Siegel, and then John Carroll. Hi, everyone. Wow, so exciting. Um, congratulations, and thank you. Um, and of course, it's been said so many times, thank you, Diane, for all your work to get us here. So we have um, the words of my pastor with us, and she gave this lecture sermon um, a few weeks ago, and it just it was I asked her for permission, and um, it's a, we're a CUCC down South Boulder, 
The root of the tradition is trader, deliver, hand over, surrender, a handing down, a giving up. So even though tradition is often presented as the unchanging truth of the past, maybe holding fast to tradition isn't resisting questions and change, maybe it is being willing to let old patterns and old ways of thinking die when it's time. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps holding fast to our traditions is turning to the new breaking through, letting stories that suffocate die, letting rituals that don't give life move on, letting belief systems that harm unravel, letting words that build worlds we don't want remain unspoken and unsaid, sung, when all that doesn't serve falls away, what remains is what matters, what gives life. Trader, deliver, hand over, surrender, giving up, and there is a fight of what do we want to hold on to and what we want to build from and the disagreement about the best way forward. And so I just want to say that we, we have some traditions around land use and zoning that we, we need to give up, I believe, in order to move um, in the next 10 years on climate change. And I hope to be here with compassion and accountability and that will be um, in relationship in our community, really uh, creating a future that um, can hold all of us. So thank you again for your service. Thank you, Sarah Don. Lynn Siegel, um, followed by John Carroll, and then um, Davita Done. I'm eating pomegranates here as fast as I can to detoxify everything that's going on in Boulder. Can't eat too many of them. Um, we do have a history here. I was just pulling up X County DA criticized for representing 8 North. Stan Garnett. Hmm. Problem. Stephen Tebow leased units illegally. Hmm. Yeah. Problem. Um, now, 1852 Arapaho. I want it landmarked. It's the last affordable housing for college students or for anyone in Boulder. It used to be commercial, then it's residential. Now they're arguing that it should go back to commercial. I thought that's the opposite way we're going. We need less commercial, more housing. Um, the exemptions for housing on this article about Attempt to copy Boulder's 1% limit stirs controversy. The exemptions, the highest bar on this graph. The exemptions. Okay, you build something like the balsam across from the hospital, four bedrooms or three, 3,400 square feet, four baths in each place. Uh, in my house, I have two and a half baths in the same area plot of land they have 20 bathrooms, five units, four bedrooms each. What's wrong with this problem? That is not gonna solve our housing problem. And neither is the permanently affordable housing. You don't stick it on the permanently affordable, uh, on the middle class. Why should they take less uh, of you know, interest in their house? Why should the city pay for that? Thank you, Lynn. With a potential bond rating lowering when we have a downturn. Thank you, Lynn. Next up is John Carroll, and then um, David Dadone, and after David is Mason Moyer. Hi there, everyone. My name is John Carroll. I live on Koala Drive in Boulder. Um, welcome to everyone. It's great to see some fresh faces up here on council, and congratulations. Um, I'm here on behalf of the South Boulder Creek Action Group and all of my friends and neighbors in the Fraser Meadows neighborhood. Um, all of us are in harm's way the next time it floods, um, and the CU South Flood Mitigation Project is incredibly important to us. Um, I look forward to working with you all to move this project forward, um, and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, David Dadone, and then um, Mason Moyer, and then after that, Ingrid Avison. Good evening, City Council. My name is David Adone. I'm the, I'm the Executive Director of the Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art. I would like to give a warm welcome to all new council members and to thank the continuing council members for their support of the arts and the community. Bimoka is here 
to bring art to our community and to make creative experiences accessible to all. Each year, we serve 114,000 individuals and more than 7,500 youth through our education programs. And currently, we partner with over 40 organizations to support local artists and local arts nonprofits. Our reach, budget, and programming have all grown significantly and far beyond what our current facility was designed to accommodate. It is with this in mind that I'm here tonight. First, some background. In 2017, the City of Boulder voters overwhelmingly supported ballot measure 2MNN, which approved a matching grant of $1 million for Bimoka to expand its building and programming for the community. We strongly believe with Boulder voters that an expanded Bimoka will both allow us to better serve the community and it will enliven the East Book End through free public programming and serendipitous encounters with art. In 2018, city planning staff and city council identify an, expanded, an expansion of Bimoka to the south as a, quote, highest priority used to be included in all the sign alternatives, end of quote, for the East Book End. We have identified an appropriate facility for this expansion, which is conveniently located next door to Bimoka and is currently in use by the city. We have proposed a phase expansion plan, which takes into account all needs, as well as all parties concerned, and we look forward to working more closely with this council in these regards. Today, Bimoka is ready and excited to expand its facilities and we thank you for your support and welcome. Thank you, David. Mason Moyer, Moyer and then Ingrid Avison and Elizabeth Black. Congratulations and um, welcome to our new council. I'm Mason Moyer, founder of Boulder Progressives, a community organization that views governance, climate action, land use, housing policy, transportation, policing, and other issues through a human rights lens. This is a perspective from which the outgoing council did not perform well relative to the city's stated values about inclusivity, diversity, and service. Since the 2017 elections, we have seen the police department abdicate their duty to protect Boulder citizens and visitors as people open carried assault weapons down Pearl Street. We have seen and witnessed unacceptable police force in interactions with our homeless population. We have seen and witnessed unacceptable police use racial profiling as a tool to harass Boulder citizens. And we have seen the people of Boulder marching the, in the streets to protest these actions. That's what it took to finally get Boulder to look at police oversight and reform. We the people had to lead our leaders. Since the 2017 election, we have seen a consolidation of homeless services that has literally left some homeless out in the cold and has eliminated Boulder's most inclusive and welcoming of emergency homeless services reaching our most vulnerable of people. Since the 2017 elections, we have seen a council so aligned around implementing anti-housing policies that they would leave citizens' lives at risk as they negotiate over how to mitigate flooding problems around CU. We have seen a council so against new residential development that they have continued to accept over 60,000 people commuting into Boulder for work each day, climate impacts and traffic concerns be damned. We have seen a council that even after being shown how these land use and housing policies drive racist and classist outcomes have continued to pursue these policies with vigor. I'm gonna get caught off in a second, but the people who organized for human rights, inclusivity, diversity, and change in our city have spoken. How our police treat community members of color and homelessness in our community have spoken. We hope that you will lead with inclusive compassion and see the world through human rights lens and Thank advocate you, for those that are least able to advocate for themselves. Thank you. Next is Ingrid Avison, Elizabeth Black, and then Nicole Perlman. So Ingrid is not here? Okay, so um, Elizabeth Black. Hello. Congratulations, new and returning council members. I wish you convivial times solving Boulder's problems. Last month I told you about soil health and explained how healthier soils fight climate change. 
Today I'll tell you about the Citizen Science Soil Health Project, which helps growers improve their soil's health. I have recruited 40 local growers to join the 10-year-long Citizen Science Soil Health Project. Our very diverse growers include nine commodity farmers, 14 organic farmers, eight ranchers, 19 OSMP sites, eight forest sites, and two golf courses. Our growers each receive one free soil health test each year and can buy as many other soil health tests as they want. They collect their own soil samples. I send samples in for testing, track the results, and pass them on to our growers. Our growers have all agreed to improve their soil health over the 10 years of our project, but they will each improve their soil health in whatever way they think best. Our growers have very diverse soil types, diverse crops, water availability, and growing methods, so we can't compare one grower with another. We only compare each grower with themselves over the 10 years of our project. We are funded by the USDA, OSMP, and nine other local groups. Costs are $250 per grower per year. We've raised the money for our first four years of expenses. In 2019, we enrolled 40 growers, taught them how to take soil samples, completed our first round of testing, and analyzed our baseline results. Next time, I'll tell you about the general trends we've discovered. Stay tuned for our next exciting installment. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Can't wait. Nicole Perlman, followed by Juana Gomez and Beck Spoon. Good evening, I'm Nicole Perlman and I live in Boulder. It's such a pleasure to be here tonight and so exciting to see so many good new and old faces. Really appreciate the opportunity. I wanted to just quickly bring up two issues that are really important to me as council starts uh, the new session here. Um, the first is the issue of the homeless in Boulder. I've been learning more about this as a public policy issue and my understanding that there's something now like 4,200 homeless in Boulder and something like 250 shelter beds. And when I found that out, I was just aghast, um, especially as you read stories about people freezing to death. I think in a town as, to use the word wealthy, um, with so many privileges that we have, it's just horrifying to me that we can't do more about that. It's horrifying to me that we can't leave the emergency shelter open um, every night of the year, especially given that it would basically cost pennies on the dollar to do that. I've heard some people say that that would draw more people from Denver, which is why we don't do better for the people here. But to me, that strikes of the same logic as sort of Trump's build the wall, so to speak. Um, so I think we really should try to do better by everybody that lives in this town, and I think we can do that for, like I said, pennies on the dollar. I hope you'll take that under consideration. Uh, the second issue that's of concern to me is how we treat immigrants, and it's also come to my attention that we have a big multinational company owned by the GEO Group in this town called BI that you'll be hearing a lot more about from many concerned citizens. Uh, this company has uh, $500 million billion, million dollars um, from ICE to run the only electronic detention program in the country. We've received some horrific stories of immigrants that have been abused by this company. Um, and many of them actually do live right here in Boulder County. I think as a sanctuary city, um, not only should we do better, but I think we're morally, morally obligated to do better. I'm gonna encourage the council to really take a look at what that means to be a sanctuary city, what the um, policy implications are, what it means to have a company in town that we know um, from dozens of documented stories is openly abusing immigrants' rights, and you'll be hearing a lot more about this in the coming weeks. Thank, Thank you, you so Nicole. much. Juana Gomez, followed by Beck Spoon, and then Patrick Murphy. Hello, Council. Thank you, and welcome to the new Council members and returning. Uh, as a member of the community and as a library commissioner, I thank you for the additional funds in the latest budget to meet some immediate needs. Thank you also for your stated commitment to funding our library system. It is time now to discuss the creation of a library district. We are into our third year of intently studying the library's funding. A year ago, we presented the master plan to you and, received, and you received it well. It is the culmination of internal and external reviews that included input from community surveys, open conversations, and focus groups. 
In the Commission's foreword of the Master Plan, we stated our unanimous endorsement for creating a library district as the most viable and best mechanism that provides the capital necessary to pay for the current and future needs. A subsequent statistically valid poll contracted by the City of Boulder confirmed that there would be wide voter support for funding such a district. As you know, our budget has not grown in proportion to the city's since 2002. Meanwhile, the demands continue to grow on the library as our most trusted public institution, as a visitor destination, as the place in our city that best exemplifies diversity, equity, inclusion, as a community hub, as a source for innovation, and as a secular place of refuge. The beautiful North Boulder branch and a future Gun Barrel Library will embody all these qualities if funded adequately. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juana. Beck Spoon, followed by Patrick Murphy, and then James Feeney. Hi. Um, we rarely chal challenge our own preconceptions, privileges, and the standpoint from which we reason. My wish for the current incarnation of City Council is that y'all work on that as individuals and as a group. Um, wherever you uniquely land on a specific subject, consider the following questions. How might race, gender, sexuality, ability, class, or sex impact this subject? Are the people you're hearing from and opinions being considered truly representing the diversity of identities that interact with the subject? Who writes the books and articles used to inform your opinions? Um, who are you listening to? What identities and experiences that, that might differ from your own? Are you looking for what you don't know? Are you shifting some focus and power away from the most privileged in the conversation? And are you prioritizing the opinions of those who are often overlooked? The notion that we're equally impacted by council decisions isn't holding up. This is an invitation. What can you do in your role as a city council member to share and relinquish power with the appropriate people? I also want to read a quick statement for, um, from Jenna McAfee, who wasn't able to participate because of the lottery, but she attended a panel discussion on November 12th about the manifestation of trauma in the immigrant and refugee population, and it was heartbreaking and reinforces our concerns about how BI treats um, asylum seekers. And we have heard stories in the last month about inhumane treatment in Colorado um, of people who have already been trauma traumatized by their asylum seeking experience and then re-traumatized by the program run by BI. And so she was really pleased that two council members are going to be um, joining us in the second meeting with BI on November, November 21st and looks forward to having your support in this extremely important matter. Thanks. Thank you, Bex. Patrick Murphy, followed by James Feeney and Claudia Team. My name is Patrick Murphy, I live in Boulder. Leaving, staying, or coming. To those of you on past, present, and future city councils, I wish you discernment. You have to figure out what you did and did not do right, and what is or is not right. Propaganda is messing up logic. It's easy to recognize propaganda. It only presents one side of the truth and claims to be the full truth. When the full truth finally arrives, it's easy to recognize propaganda. Who was and is supposed to present the Muni full truth, but only presents half truth? That would be bolder. That would be us. The Muni is a failure in many ways. The alternatives would work successfully and immediately in many ways. Are failure and success so hard to differentiate? I don't think so. So I wonder why the Muni continues when the full truth should be known. It's clear to me the Muni continues because the full truth has been hidden over the last eight years due to intention, incompetence, ignorance, vain denial, or ego and job preservation. 
The road to muni failure has been paved with good intentions and center striped with a lack of true critical review and honesty. The planet burns, floods, and dies while Boulder fiddles. Time to burn the fiddle and let real carbon reduction begin. Why would Boulder want to end the muni? Because we can do math. We don't like to be fooled, and the words urgent and existential mean something real. The muni process will take five more years, and in the end, close to a billion dollars. Lost decade, lost billion, doesn't make sense, doesn't add up. Subtract the muni and let real carbon reduction begin. Thank you, Patrick. James Feeney, followed by Claudia Team and Ethan O'Green. I'm James Feeney from North Boulder. As Board of Directors for the City of Boulder Municipal Corporation, please consider your appointment of senior officers. Council may consider a $217,000 report earlier this year on workplace climate by consultant Team Tipton, which found a pervasive sense of futility and low morale among city manager staff based upon a sampling of two city departments. And subsequently, while assistant manager Chris Meshuk has reportedly brushed off concerns that these issues could cause a mass departure of city employees. I'm also aware of reports that in other departments, some 60% of department staff have been lost or are planning to leave in less than a month. Reasons cited include employees being called stupid by department managers in closed door one-on-one -on -one meetings, and employees being required to work with dysfunctional and mismanaged software. And then council may consider the incident last March involving a young black man at Naropa University and city manager's police. During that incident, we see third degree criminal trespass given there's a private property sign on the property, a class one petty offense, a second degree criminal trespass given it's an apartment building, a class three misdemeanor, first degree criminal trespass given the trespass is in a dwelling, a class five felony, racial harassment given he's a young black man, a class one misdemeanor, menacing given several guns are drawn, a class five felony, and racketeering given that the crimes are committed by an organized group, a class two felony. Despite the commission of petty offenses, uh, two misdemeanors, uh, three felonies, city attorney saw nothing wrong. I ask city council to please reflect upon the consequences of their choice of officers. Thanks. Thank you, James. Claudia Team, followed by Ethan O'Green and Peter, Petra Herrera. Good evening, members of council, and welcome to all of you on the first night of this new session. My name is Claudia hansen theme I live in Boulder, and I'm on the steering committee of Boulder Progressives. There are so many issues we want you to hear about tonight, so I'm really grateful that speakers before me, Val, Sarah Dawn, John, Mason, Nicole, Juana, and Bex have addressed some of them so passionately. Since I had to bring my kids with me tonight, I thought I would speak about the thing that concerns me most as a parent, and that is climate change. As leaders in an environmentally woke city, you all know that we have 10 years to make serious progress on reducing global carbon emissions. And while we're working hard locally to reduce waste and decarbonize our electricity supply, that is not enough. There is no scenario for a sustainable and socially just future that includes the level of private resource consumption we've enshrined in our approach to housing, transportation, and land use in Boulder. The way we've built our city locks even the best intentioned people into carbon intensive ways of living. And to do our part, to say nothing of being leaders, we need to support radical changes to how we live. <coughs> In the next two years, I will be here as often as I can to advocate for modest housing in truly walkable and inclusive neighborhoods, for pedestrian, bike, and transit infrastructure, and for a rich public realm that will help us to minimize our per capita carbon footprints. And despite my anxiety and grief for the future, I will pursue these things with joy because I believe they make our community stronger, happier, and more equitable. Going forward, we'll have plenty of time to get into the weeds together. But tonight, I join the chorus assembled here in asking you to think big, to remember what is at stake and the timeline that we're on. In this climate emergency, what will you do to lead? Thank you, Claudia. Ethan O'Green, followed by Petra Herrera, and then Matt Benjamin. 
Congratulations to our newly elected city councilors. I'm a tree tenor with the Tree Trust, tree trust a program led by Play Boulder Foundation to work with citizens to support trees in Boulder and promote a healthy urban tree canopy for years to come. The Tree Tenor program educates and empowers citizens to take care of our local trees. Tree tenors like myself learn basic tree planting maintenance and we connect with community members in need of assistance caring for and planting trees on private property. We facilitate tree distributions, lead volunteers and planning projects and share tree trust initiatives with the community. In 2018, Boulder Forestry received approval for the Urban Forest Strategic Plan, a comprehensive 20-year plan for our Boulder urban tree canopy. Boulder's urban canopy covered approximately 16% of the city's area in 2013. Ash tree losses due to Elmer, Elmer, emerald ash borer will reduce Boulder's canopy by nearly 25% in the coming years. Boulder Forestry's overarching 20-year goal is to preserve and maintain rather than increase its current canopy covered with 16%. I believe this is a wrong policy. Boulder should work in the coming decades to increase our tree canopy cover because air quality is getting worse and trees provide critical mitigation for climate change, including soil carbon sequestration, water retention, and direct remediation of air pollution. Most of Boulder's exi existing tree canopy is in central and north Boulder and the foothills. I believe we should create new forest buffer zones in east and south Boulder, along highway, highway and busy road medians, and throughout the perimeters of rural and open space land surrounding the urban core, especially to mitigate the poor air quality and often toxic air pollution blowing in from Weld County, fracking, and from the brown cloud of, of Denver. Um, on a global scale, we can affordably scale regenerative practices to the 12 billion acres of farmland and pasture land across the world and draw down more than one, one trillion tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into agricultural soils. Let's lead this effort locally by investing in a Boulder-based Green New Deal, working towards 100% clean energy and regenerative land stewardship of public and open space lands. Thank you, Ethan. Petra Herrera, followed by Matt Benjamin, and then Mark Gelband. Hola, buenas noches. Buenas tardes. Me llamo Petra Herrera, vivo en San Juan del Centro. Y pone papel, me dice papel. Good evening. Uh, her name is Petra Herrera, and we live in the 2.5 square mile opportunity zone. And no one from the city told us about the proposed development in the opportunity zone. And we have three quick but very important questions. Why did the city not inform citizens about the opportunity zone? And why has the city ignored our questions and comments? Why has the city not informed us about nor invited us to participate in the community, community planning committee? Thank you very much for your attention. Gracias. Gracias. Yeah. And ma'am, uh, at the end of open comment, I think we'll make sure that the city manager addresses your questions. So if you just hold tight for a couple of minutes, we'll, we'll get back to you. Después de estos comentos, um, vamos a contestar sus preguntas. Uh, Matt Benjamin, Mark Galband, and then Clint Todd. Hi everyone, Matt Benjamin, live in South Boulder. Um, it is nice, yeah, I'm a little taller than the last speaker. Not as tall as Adam, though, so you gotta lift that up too, right? Um, Thank you all for the new faces. Um, it's nice to see the new and the old, and I think new faces means a fresh start. A fresh start on some of the issues that we have maybe had false starts on uh, up to this point. <clears throat> I think of CU South, flood mitigation. It's kind of had a false start, maybe a few false starts on that. What's a fresh start for us? A fresh start is to take some of the action you have right in front of you. You have opportunities in the next six months to create real action instead of playing politics with the lives of 3,500 residents. And I'm looking at some of the new faces and some of those that have been here a while and looking at the opportunity we have with a group that has really campaigned on being more moderate and less extreme in past years. So what is more moderation? More moderation is taking the legal right you have on council to apply flood mitigation as a use to open space. Occam's razor says that the best solution is often the simplest. That's the simplest. Your second option is certainly to dispose, both of which can be done without waiting for anything, without waiting for NEPA or any ESA studies or waiting for CDOT or waiting for the university. This is action that can show the 3,500 residents in the flood zone that you're really serious about caring for their well-being. The second thing that's really clear that is a fresh start is how we approach housing. Again, we've had some false starts. I think of Alpine Balsam as, as an example of that. How are we gonna reach that goal of 15% of affordable housing? 
We need to be real in our approaches. We need to start thinking bigger, and we need to actually start increasing our inventory now. Because by not doing that, you just mean you have to build more later. And that's not something that I think certainly some of you don't want to see. So moderation is key there, and that's a fresh start. And lastly, the last fresh start we have has to do with the Tipton Report, staff morale and being, bringing out the best in the staff that we have in our community, their expertise, their knowledge, their willingness to tackle these issues head on. We should be encouraging those great ideas and fostering a com community and an environment for them to be best and less micromanagement and allow them to do the best thing for our community with your steadfast leadership. Thank you and I look forward to seeing you guys again soon. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Mark Galbond, followed by Clint Todd and John Taylor. Mark Gelband, 505 College. Welcome, new council, congratulations. I'm gonna echo, although it was not coordinated, um, a bunch of what's already been said. For the first time in my 30, 30 plus years in Boulder, I'm heartened by a community that has voted with a clear notion that diversity, inclusivity, and social equity matter. And at this point in our time in history, it is undeniable the connections among housing, climate change, all transportation, diversity, inclusivity, and social equity. People may disagree on how we get there, but the fact that we still make single family housing sacrosanct in this community is absurd on face value because what it does and what it has, do has done, and I will cha challenge Aaron, Sam, Bob, Mark Wallach, to look at this through the eyes, including myself, of five white, middle-aged, privileged, single-family homeowners. I have watched this community make decisions that consistently value the ideas of the most privileged and proximate single-family homeowners over a sense of community. And I too will challenge you to broaden your perspectives and to think about Boulder's homeless, the lack of diversity and inclusivity that we hear all about in this community. As a father who raised two brown children, both of whom who have been called the N-word too many times, I am ready for change that includes an acknowledgement of the problems that have not been addressed for 40 plus years in this community. And I challenge particularly the men who look most like me to stand up and make those changes. Thank you, Mark. Clint Todd, followed by John Tare. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm present here tonight to voice my support for the 26th Street NSMP project that's up for call-up consideration this evening. Um, my, I live directly on 26th Street within the project boundary. I use the street daily in my car, on my bicycle, walking uh, with my wife and my two young daughters, nine and 11. Um, my 11-year-old is now commuting to Centennial Middle School. Uh, she's a sixth grader, and uh, frankly, I'm, I'm concerned about her safety on the street. As I'm sure you, you'll see in the report from Ryan and his team, the proposal enjoys overwhelming neighborhood support. It also has the rather infamous moniker of scoring the highest 85th percentile speed in any of the 20 neighborhood streets that were that were up for um, the study this year and so I think it's the worst of the worst speeding streets in Boulder if, if you can believe that uh, I think the reason is that commuters are coming down well going both ways but they're trying to avoid the traffic on 28th Street so they're cutting through a neighborhood um, with one stop sign in 25 mile an hour speed limits that's not set up not set up to handle that kind of traffic and those types of speeds because of the bike paths and the schools and all the other things that are on 26th Street. So I'm I'm asking that you uh, approve the call up, uh, or excuse me, approve the proposal at call up tonight so we can get those speed mitigation project underway as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Clint. John Tare. 
Thank you, John Terre with the Boulder Chamber. And if my time allows, I will have appreciation, unfinished business, and shared goals. So first of all, just joining in the chorus of congratulations and thank you to the newly elected council members as well as the returning members. I'll just say that one thing that Boulder is great, is, it makes Boulder great is the passion and commitment of our citizenry and the leaders um, who commit to public service. And the Boulder Chamber shares that commitment to and passion for health helping our community and, and making sure that we build community through business, so we look forward to working with you in the coming years. But first, some unfinished business, which comes in a statement of apology to uh, Council Member Young. Um, and this is an open letter, so I will read it. As I read this formal note of apology to you, it has been exactly six weeks, one day, and two hours since I looked at my calendar while meeting with an out-of-town colleague at the Duchambe Tea House and realized I had made one of the worst scheduling mistakes of my career. My colleague later wrote that I felt for me, he felt for me, after seeing the expression on my face, recognizing, quote, the mortifying oversight I obviously had made. Yes, it was mortifying, though it wasn't me that deserved the condolences. It was clear to me that I just screwed up the chance I had to rectify the break in our relationship that occurred due, due to previously missed meetings. Further, and most critically, I knew that breaking trust, I was breaking trust and displaying disrespect, albeit unintentionally, to a leader in our community who deserves much better. I stand before you tonight embarrassed by and truly sorry for the pattern of behavior that I exhibited in my relationship with you. I know as Council Member Sam Weaver suggested, I need to dig deep in my heart to understand how could I have committed such a terrible series of errors. I have and will continue to do so. To that end, and as you requested in our brief exchange the other day, I stand before you tonight and offer my sincere apology. However unintended, no one, let alone someone I respect for their role, you play in our community deserves such treatment. Sincerely, John Tear. Acknowledged and accepted. Council Member Young, I'm sorry. That closes, yeah. Uh, we have Ingrid here to speak. Oh, okay, please. Ingrid? Thank you, and sorry for being late. Um, my name is Ingrid Avison. I'm a Boulder resident and a clinical social worker here in Boulder. Um, and among many important issues facing our community today, I want to impress upon you the importance and urgency of taking firm, significant action steps to leverage the power that you all have to support the human rights of immigrants in the Boulder County by holding the company BI Incorporated accountable for their human rights violations against immigrants. The inhumanity that immigrants are subject to right now at the border is awful, as we all know, and it's unacceptable, and it's also easy to distance ourselves from what's happening here um, by pointing the finger elsewhere. So I hope to um, look right under our noses at the violent and oppressive inhumane systems that are running day in and day out. Um, so let's see, only a minute left. All right, so I urge city council to divest from the private prison and detention companies, pressing the owners of BI Inc. to uh, building to vacate it and asking BI Inc. to cancel contracts with ICE. I urge city council to invest in a community-based case management model with research from the National Immigrant Justice Center that suggests having 90% compliance rates and costs 80% less in detention than detention. And I urge council to prioritize taking up a comprehensive audit of all city departmental policy policies to see how they align with the sanctuary policy that uh, we passed in 2017. Uh, I urge council to continue to stand with the community to encourage BI to enact other measures that will directly improve the lives of immigrants in Colorado. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. So with that, um, I will close the pub public comment and we'll move on to um, the consent agenda. Mary? Yes. Will you ask? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, so there are two items that came up that I want to respond to. So the first was Mr. Dadone from the Boulder um, Museum of Contemporary Art and his request that the city um, 
provide additional space for the expansion of that facility. The space that the, uh, Bamoka has identified is actually owned by the city and used every single day by our parks operations staff that works on cleaning up the parks and managing the parks in the local uh, Central Park area. That building is not for sale currently, and we would need to do a facility study to find a place to move all of the equipment and all of the employees that would need to be centrally located so that we continu could continue to provide services in this area. We are currently undertaking a facility study, and um, Yvette Bowden from Community Vitality has written to Mr. Dadone with regard to this, and he is well aware of the fact that we are undertaking that facility study. So to move forward right now would be very premature, and I wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. Uh, the second item was Ms. Herrera, who spoke about the Opportunity Zone, and what I picked up from her question is, why were they not included in a sub-community plan with regard to the Opportunity Zone? The thing is that there is not a sub-community plan that covers the entire Opportunity Zone. We are working on the East Boulder sub-community plan, which involves an area that is mostly to the eastern part of the Opportunity Zone, as well as an area that is outside the Opportunity Zone. So we, we don't have a sub-community plan underway that would include the areas to the western part. I don't know if there are other parts of her question that you'd like me to answer, but I'm happy to. Well, could I translate first? Sure. Um, sure. Le ha contestado su pregunta, Petra, um, de que por qué no se fueron incluidos en el proceso de, um, de planificar um, la comunidad um, en el oeste, en el este de, de Boulder. Y no hay, es que no hay un proceso por planificar ahí. Hay un proceso por planificar un poquito más al este de allí, pero específicamente um, un, pla un plan que incluye um, San Juan no existe. Um, así es de que no hay proceso y por eso no han sido incluidos. Um, yo voy a uh, también uh, comentar un poco más um, cerca de su pregunta um, de, um, en San Juan del Centro. Porque, como usted sabe, um, yo estoy bien involucrada con um, muchos procesos que están ocurriendo en San Juan del Centro. Um, y una de las cosas que ocurrió hace poco es que recibimos un, um, un correo electrónico um, de um, Brenda Lyle. Uh, preguntando qué um, que, que, que íbamos a hacer cerca del, um, de que iban a, a, a deshacerse de los apartamentos uh, de San Juan y, y qué íbamos a hacer cerca de eso. La verdad es que no hay planes para que alguien se deshaga de los apartamentos. Los apartamentos van a seguir siendo um, um, casas, hogares para ustedes, por muchos años. Um, esa fue una prometa que recibí yo de los dueños um, de los apartamentos. Um, y también um, cerca del, um, del Opportunity Zone, um, no hay posibilidad de que ocurra una destrucción de sus apartamentos porque um, el, um, nosotros, el City Council, um, hemos uh, puesto un... Um, una prohibición contra que, que se deshagan de los apartamentos. Así es de que no hay peligro um, y quería dejarles de saber de eso. Um, so, basically, I added to Jane's comment a whole bunch, um, saying that we, um, that we um, have put in place um, um, what we have done on the, in the Opportunity Zone that has the prohibition against destruction of um, demolition of any um, housing. So there's no danger, and um, I also added that we have received an email from Brenda Lyle um, asking um, why we were going to allow the, um, the apartments, San Juan del Centro apartments, to be sold, and um, that is absolutely not true. I contacted the owners um, of the apartments out in New York, and um, they said they have absolutely no plans, and they're committed to keeping it affordable housing um, for the foreseeable and um, long into the future. So, thanks, Mary. You're welcome. Yeah. Mary. I'd yeah. 
Yeah, th th that was, thank you for saying all that because that was what I wanted to make sure we got out. <clears throat> but not only have they, the owners expressed that they plan to keep it affordable housing, they're actually required by their contracts. So it's not just their goodwill that we're relying on, um, just to add that. Sí, y um, Aaron está diciendo que no solamente han uh, prometido los dueños de los apartamentos, también están uh, bajo de un contrato para mantenerlos um, como hogares asequibles. Así es de que no hay peligro. Thank you for the translator. Sam. So one more thing to be clear about the um, East Boulder subcommunity plan, which is underway right now, um, has almost no residential in it at all. So it has 400 residences um, in the plan, and those are not actually within the city boundaries yet. So those are uh, um, Mobile Home Park, which is just adjacent to, but the staff decided to include it because it's contiguous with the city. So just to be clear, the current subcommunity plan doesn't have much to do with existing housing. Así es, el, uh, el señor dice, uh, Weaver dice que um, también lo que está ocurriendo, la planificación que está ocurriendo al este de allí, um, no tiene um, residencias para, um, no, no tiene viviendas, um, solamente um, um, tiene un, um, un parque de casas móviles que no está dentro de la ciudad oficialmente, pero fue incluida en esta planificación. All right, um, anything else? Council? Juni. Thank you so much. As a new member of council, I just have a quick question because I understand this is about the opportunity zone, but I would like to know what are we doing to ensuring that people who live on the west side, as you mentioned, they get the opportunity to express themselves and be part of the process. Because from what I'm hearing, that yes, we, ha we are starting this East sub-community plan, but these people were not part of the process somehow. What can we do and what are we doing to ensure that they are part of the process, even for the future? So, yeah. can I answer that? Um, um, we are, um, so last year there was a, um, an issue at San Juan del Centro that had to do with um, some um, less than savory um, towing that was going on, and um, so, the council passed a, or basically localized a state law um, that um, prohibited some of the towing that was going on. So um, as a result of that, the city also um, has begun a, um, an effort to organize the residents. And so the residents are um, being empowered as part of that process to, um, to reach out to the city, and um, actually many of them do reach out um, to me, so. Um, estaba preguntando um, a la señora Joseph, que, a la señorita Joseph, creo, uh, que, um, que sí que está, que está ocurriendo para, um, para incluir a uh, esta comunidad, um, y yo le uh, compartí que una de las cosas que está ocurriendo es que hay un, um, un esfuerzo para organizar la comunidad um, de San Juan. Así es de que um, si tiene interés a Petra, yo le he pedido que se involucre um, y ojalá que sí. Any other questions? All right. Um, so um, with that, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Items A through L are before you tonight on your consent agenda. I move the consent agenda. Um, so before we uh, make a motion, there was um, a question that came up during um, CAC which had to do with um, the supplemental appropriations. Just a little more clarification about that. <clears throat> or actually, is that for? The, yeah, we were going to talk about that on December 3rd. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so then um, we'll just leave that for December 3rd. Um, so. I second the motion, Bob. Okay, uh, moved and seconded. Um, all in favor? Oops. Oh, Aaron? Sorry, keep keep popping out here. I, I just wanted to um, mention, uh, I had some first reading questions about the building code, but I'll just send that out over hotline in the next few days, so you can just, folks in planning department can watch for those. Thank you. And just to note, you have on your dais uh, on, in green paper uh, an update to item 3H, 
which has to do with a lease to XL Energy for undergrounding um, some lines that will serve the 30 Pearl project. Uh, that was just finalized this afternoon, which is great news. Um, so by passing this, you'll help enable. And uh, Kurt Fernhaber is here. If you have any questions, his staff did a tremendous job, along with David Gear in my office, in getting this, this done for you tonight. Cool. Thank you. Sorry. Sam? So that's great news, Tom, and it's really good for uh, moving 30 Pearl forward. So I'm very happy about that. Um, will allow us to sell the first market rate plot at 30 Pearl and bring in money, which will enable some of the affordable housing projects to move forward. So that's great work, and I'm glad to see that moving forward. The other thing I would bring up is that we've received a few emails about including Appendix Q in our building code, and what that translates into in non-planning speak is um, tiny housing rules, which um, will be incorporated in the new adoption of the building code. So it will enable tiny houses to be built in Boulder on fixed foundations. And so we, we have that at first reading tonight, so there won't be any discussion of it. I know there was some interest in the community about that, and so by moving this forward, we will be advancing to second reading where we will discuss any of the codes that are of interest. So I just wanted to highlight that for the community. All right. Anything else? This All right. Is a roll so call vote. Okay. We start with Council Member Nagel. Aye. Swetlick? Aye. Wallach? Aye. Weaver? Aye. Yates? Aye. Young? Yes. Brockett? Aye. Friend? Aye. Joseph? Aye. The motion passes unanimously. You have two call up check ins this evening. The first one is an accessory building at 730 Maxwell Avenue. Any interest in calling it up or comments? All right. Okay, your second one is a 2020 neighborhood speed management complex project installation. And on this one, we have a staff presentation. So Bill Cowan and Ryan Knowles are here from our transportation department. Good evening, members of City Council. While Ryan's getting this set up, I'll just introduce, um, as Jane mentioned, my name is Bill Cowan. I'm the city's principal traffic engineer and interim transportation director, joined by my colleague Ryan Knowles, who administers the Neighborhood Speed Management Program. Um, we're here tonight um, with an item on the call up uh, pertaining to two complex projects that the, the first two complex projects that have gone through the Neighborhood Speed Management Program and, and are now in front of you for adoption so that we could move forward and construct them. But uh, at the Council Agenda Committee, um, it was asked that we present some information about the Neighborhood Speed Management Program, um, some of the things that we do through the program, um, and uh, some information about the backlog of, of projects. And so with that, Ryan will present. Thank you, Bill. No, it's not. Thank you, Bill. So my name is Ryan, and I'm a transportation planner with the city here. And uh, this evening, we want to provide you with an overview of the Neighborhood Speed Management Program, talk about some things that we've done, and then really focus in on the 26th Street and 55th Street complex projects. So the purpose of the Neighborhood Speed Management Program is to reduce speeding on residential streets in the city uh, with the goal of improving the quality of life and safety in, neighbor in neighborhoods across the city. Uh, and that's in pursuit of our Vision Zero goals and our transportation master plan goals. The NSMP was created by the community and hosted by TAB in uh, 2017 through a very robust community engagement process. The program has a $250,000 annual budget, which is allocated by council each year. It has four components, education, enforcement, engineering, and evaluation. And to date, since uh, summer 2018, we've installed speed humps on 15 streets and a school zone radar speed display sign, a pair of them, 
on uh, Hawthorne Avenue. So by registering for the Neighborhood Speed Management Program, uh, all applicants and all neighborhoods that get into the program are eligible for education and enforcement tools. So these include yard signs, the mobile speed trailers you see on a weekly basis throughout the city, as well as targeted enforcement and photo radar bands. By also filling out a petition, you are entered into consideration for uh, traffic calming, so things like speed humps, traffic circles, raised crosswalks, et cetera. And so by completing a application, that greenlights the city to do a speed study to see if the uh, street will qualify for engineering. Once we find that a street qualifies, we uh, categorize the project as either simple or complex. So simple projects are uh, less than or equal to $15,000, are not on emergency response routes, and uh, typically have no adjacent impacts, uh, or impacts to adjacent streets, rather. Whereas a complex project is typically more than $15,000, can be on an emergency response route, and may have some impacts to adjacent streets, and so we'll have to take a look at those while we're doing the planning. The NSMP guidelines include a, include a scoring criteria, uh, which is how we rank and prioritize projects in the program with a limited budget. So some of these criteria focus on the 85th percentile speed that we observe in the speed study, as well as the number of speeding vehicles, uh, the presence or lack thereof of pedestrian and bicycle facilities on a neighborhood street, and activity generating land uses, so things like schools, uh, churches, places of worship, uh, neighborhood commercial centers. And so once we create preliminary, simple, and complex project lists, we then go to TAB and ask for their review. We hold a public hearing so that uh, neighborhood residents can come and uh, share their opinions about potential projects. Then we ask TAB for a recommendation on how to move forward with the program and which projects to prioritize. So one focal area of the NSMP, one area that we've been uh, very, very focused on is equity. Uh, so during the program development, we really looked at equity in, in two specific lenses. So one was uh, funding for the program. So the NSMP guidelines actually state that a neighborhood cannot uh, contribute funding to the construction of a project, that it has to be constructed uh, with city funds alone. And the, the reason for this is really so that uh, areas of the city that are perhaps more wealthy than others cannot rise to the top of the list or get speed mitigation faster than other neighborhoods that maybe don't have those resources. Another focal area for equity during the program development stage was uh, looking at, again, those bike and pedestrian facilities or lack thereof. And so the NSMP guidelines really prioritize uh, streets that do not have things like multi-use paths, bike lanes, sidewalks, because if people are using those streets to walk or bike and don't have those facilities available, it's more important to make sure that vehicles are traveling slower on those streets than streets where you have separated facilities. During the uh, delivery of the program over the past two years, we have identified another area where equity is a concern, and that's in regard to uh, how we demonstrate neighborhood support for a project before we get started. So we've recognized that, that the petition can actually be a barrier to entry, and this, I think, was um, originally highlighted by Council Member Young. Uh, and so we found that in cases where perhaps neighborhood residents would be um, worried about signing their name and address to a petition, that there are alternative ways in which we can demonstrate support before we embark on a project. A good example of this has been uh, in Boulder Meadows, where we've held two community meetings. Um, over the summer, we actually had a second community meeting where we did a straw poll, asking folks during the break in the meeting and just at their leisure to come up and basically vote into an anonymous polling box if they would support a project or if they wouldn't. And we found that, um, so that, that meeting had over 50 participants and we found that most of those residents did support a project and so now uh, next month actually a tab will be uh, presenting a preliminary list for their recommendation that includes uh, four project streets in Boulder Meadows. So once we 
establish that a project is on the project list and we've ranked and prioritized projects, we have a strategy for implementing them in the following year. So in the first two years of the NSMP, the strategy has been to implement all the simple projects on the list because we had available funding to do so. And then to plan the top two projects from the complex project list. Uh, so these are 26th Street and 55th Street, which we planned this previous year for installation in the following year. So the reason we had funding to install all the simple projects in the beginning of the program was that we didn't have the cost of planning and implementing the complex projects. The complex projects have a longer project development process timeline than the simple projects do. So in a simple project, you plan and install a project in one year. With a complex project, you plan a project in one year and then install it in the next. And so we've come to a moment in the SMP now where basically we have to pay for the installation of the complex projects uh, in 2020 which means that we'll have a reduced number of projects with the current available funding for simple projects. So going forward, um, you can see on the right-hand side of the slide there that there are 17 projects on the complex project list and all average about a 75,000, 50, they're between 50 and $100,000 each, so average would be about 75,000. So to implement all of them would cost over $1.2 million. And again, the program budget annually is $250,000. So again, the reason we are here this evening is really to present the top two complex projects which we just planned and are planning to install next year um, and ask for your consideration of a call up on these. So. We began the process of planning these projects in February uh, with a TAB recommendation. And really we kicked off the planning process between April and continued through September. We held three neighborhood meetings for each project location, uh, asking for feedback at each of the meetings. We developed two uh, conceptual design alternatives and really engaged the community as much as we could to get feedback on those alternatives and came up with two recommended staff recommended designs which we presented to TAB in October. TAB recommended that we move forward with the project and so tonight we are presenting these recommended designs to you for your consideration as a call up item through December 18th. Should the projects not get called up then we will uh, continue with our plans to install the projects by the end of next year. The top ranked project uh, from last year's complex project list was 26th Street. And uh, so the recommended design that we developed with the community over those three community meetings includes two medians. So one is north of Calmia Avenue and one is south of J Road. And then in between those two medians with Norwood kind of being the center of the project area, uh, there are three speed cushions. So it'd be median, speed cushion, speed cushion, speed cushion, Norwood, Speed cushion, speed cushion, speed cushion, median. For 55th Street, the recommended design includes buffered bike lanes south of Baseline Road before 55th Street narrows, and then a series of five speed cushions with shared lane uh, markings. The total projected cost for 55th is between 30 and $34,000, and for 26th Street, it's between 88 and $100,000. So next steps for the program and the complex projects. Again, in December, we will ask TAB to finalize new complex and simple project lists and to prioritize which projects to work on in 2020. And then we will begin planning and installing those projects next year. For the complex projects, again, if you choose to call, call up these projects, you have until December 18th, a 30-day period. Um, if they are not called up, then we will continue with our final design and engineering beginning in January, and we'll install both projects by the end of next year. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you, Ryan. Any questions for Ryan? Aaron? 
sorry I'm the one who keeps talking tonight, but a couple, a couple quick questions. I didn't see in the packet, uh, and, and maybe I missed it, any analysis of impacts on emergency response time from the, for these projects. Mm -hmm. Is that identified? So when we were developing these particular projects, we worked with uh, the fire marshal in the planning and development process, and he, had, he didn't think that the speed cushions would have a significant impact on emergency response. That was based on the one that we actually installed on Edgewood Drive in 2018. Do you want to speak to that? Um, just to clarify, the, the primary treatment that's being used on both of these devices, the speed cushion, is designed in such a way that it um, it lowers to the road on an, and is grooved in such a fashion that a fire truck's wheel span can pass through them um, and not cause emergency response delay. So maybe I'm not familiar with this treatment. Do you have a little information on what, what how exactly speed, what it looks like? Is this a little different from our regular speed bumps it, then? It looks very much like a speed hump, except that it has, um, it drops down to the road and then comes back up again at a spacing that equates to a fire truck's wheel span. Yeah. So um, a passenger car or, or even a pretty sizable truck won't be able to make use of that, but a fire truck can shoot that gap and not be delayed. Great, okay, lovely design. And are those, would those be in a spacing such that they'd be usable for cyclists as well, or is the cyclist just gonna go over the? They're on the pretty much in the middle of the travel lane, so they certainly could use them um, depending upon traffic. On 55th, they'll probably be more usable for cyclists than on 26, which already has existing bike lanes. Right, yeah, because you, but in the bike lane on 26th Street, you'll still go over the you would still speed go cushion. Over, yes, like a regular speed hump. All right, thank you. Mark? Yeah, um, just a quick question. Uh, Pine Street scored either first or second in terms of the, uh, the priorities. Um, number one, mm -hmm. um, why did we not prioritize Pine Street? So this uh, project list is actually next year's project list. So the previous list had 26th Street and 55th Street as their top projects. Thank you. And then, of course, we are we always have the potential of adding new complex projects each year, and that was the case this year as well. So we took two projects off the list, 26th and 55th, but through the process added two more complex projects on. Thank you. Anybody else have quick? Adam? Yeah, um, really quick. So I saw one, uh, public comment that stated that there wasn't an option for like no change. Was that the case when this was being presented to the public? So we did not present a no build alternative, but we did hear from a number of residents through the process that they would prefer not to see anything done. Gotcha, okay. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, um, so that's the end of the call-ups, and so we'll move on to the public hearings. Um, our first public hearing is the election of mayor and mayor pro tem. So, is anyone signed up? I'll open it up for nominations. Mark? I'd like to nominate Sam for mayor. I believe we hold a public hearing first. Oh, we hold the public hearing first? Oh, okay. Well then, let's have a public hearing. <laughs> I withdraw my nomination. <laughs> Permanently. Oops. Too bad. I go home and make dinner. And so I wasn't sure whether I could stick around, but you know, following up with what was said earlier with regards to diversity, inclusivity, social equity, and how we're going to consider who just feels like they're entitled to be the mayor here, as opposed to looking around and saying, what just happened in this community? And what just happened in this public comment? We have five white men up there, four of whom, are, again, are some version of a single family homeowner. I know, Aaron, that you live in Wild Sage and it's a community home, but you are privileged enough to own a home. And quite frankly, that, perspective excludes a significant portion of this community. And quite frankly, it, it excludes the portion of this community 
that for at least the 30 plus years that I've been here has been begging to be heard, has asked repeatedly. I've heard council after council say that they are going to w include new voices and, and it's wonderful to see someone like Adam up on the, on the dais, you know, who was given an opportunity for housing board, brings a slightly different perspective even though he comes from one of the long standing uh, political activist groups here in town, the one that has dominated the community conversation for the 30 plus years that I've lived here. It's heartening to see Mary Young. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to listen to her, to her speak in Spanish to constituencies that um, are often ignored. Uh, it's wonderful to see Rachel Friend and to see Mirabai Nagel, um, to see women included in, in the conversation. And it's especially a pleasure to me to see a first generation Haitian immigrant, um, Junie Joseph, on council uh, as someone who grew up in Miami and, and quite frankly understands how difficult the journey from, from Haiti to Miami as a teenager to sitting up on that dais, it's a pleasure uh, to, to know that she uh, was, got the second highest amount of votes in this community, only behind Bob who's been here for such a long time and earned a lot of credibility. So I would say as you consider mayor and mayor pro tem, the notion that two of the most privileged white men on the council, it's interesting that the, the three most privileged are sitting next to each other right now, um, certainly in terms of you know the amount of equity in their homes, um, that, that you consider the rest of the community, something that a lot of people ask for tonight, something that this community has quite frankly been begging for for 30 plus years and has been roundly ignored. Um, anyway, I'll leave it at that, and I just, again, um, would challenge all of you to think about that. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, are there any other folks signed up? Lynn? Adam Smith, Mayor, and Mark Wallach, pro tem. Is that the correct? No. <laughs> Denunciation? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And. The reason is we're at a housing crisis, but we're also at a um, climate crisis. And ultimately the third thing we're at is at a population crisis. And if we go on this building spree like the way we've been, we're headed for downfall on the climate crisis. And I think that Adam and Mark are gonna be most attuned to how to avoid that train wreck. Thanks. Thank you, Lynn. All right, um, if anybody else was to sign up, please do so and you can come on up and then, and then sign up afterward, Elizabeth. Yeah, come on up and you can sign up afterward. Well, hi, Beth Hondorf. I'm not sure I understand the pro tem nominees. Um, I think Mary Young should be the mayor. She's done a great job. She's been here for a while. She's um, reaches out to some of the other people in the community uh, that are not as fortunate as the rest of us. And I don't understand where the nominations came from. Wh why are we with Weaver and Yates? If, if we're just with Weaver and Yates, then I think Sam Weaver is more qualified because he has been in the climate uh, initiative from day one. And I know that the mayor travels to these climate conferences in other countries, and I think he'd be more qualified. So can somebody please explain to me how we got to pro tem of Weaver and Yates? So we can Is this do based that on after. votes? What, what we, is? We, we, can, we can address your questions, Elizabeth, after the hearing. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh, thank you. Andy? Thank you, I'll be brief because I think Mark said a lot of what I would have said. 
Um, I believe the new council, especially as representative, are, are becoming more representative of Boulder, and I think it's important that you elect leadership that also reflects that. So while it is certainly your prerogative to choose your leadership, uh, I would strongly encourage you not to select two white men. Uh, as a white male myself, I would say it's extremely important that we have voices that are not merely white men on council. Uh, I'm glad to see that, and I would like to see that in your leadership as well. So please consider that as you are selecting your leadership this evening. It will set an example for Boulder, it'll set an example for this council, and it'll set an example for the kind of voices that council uh, values going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, Katie Farnan. On the fly, I don't have anything prepared. I just wanna say, Andy and Mark, uh, I 100% agree with what they said, and I do believe that as we are trying to represent more of Boulder, that the leadership should represent more of Boulder as well, and please take that into consideration. Uh, I just agree that diversity is important, especially um, not just seats at the table, but real decision-making power, so please consider that. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. All right, um, I don't see any, oh, one more, okay. Oh, am I it? Mason? Hi, um, yeah, I, would, I wanna echo what everybody else is saying, and I think this election in general, we had a resounding um, vote for progressive values and forward thinking, and I think, again, I would go with um, women, uh, Mary, I wish you would stand. Aaron, I also think you should. I know our, it's not usually traditional to go with some of our younger um, candidates or new candidates, but again, I think we've already heard from the community and having representation after this election based on the community that stood up, because we've been hearing about this for several years, right? That the loudest voice in the room wins. Well, we're here and we would like to see representation. We voted, we stood up, and we want people to follow through with what you saw happen in this election. All right, um, so seeing no more people signed up, um, I will close this public hearing and um, continue on to the nominations. Uh, did, or does anybody want to comment? I, I was gonna suggest that you explain the rules and how we got here. All right. Um, Tom, oh, Tom, oh, yeah, Tom, I'd would you do, do it, Mary? please? Uh, the, the, these rules have evolved over time. Uh, it, it used to be that there, there was a kind of deal made and that people would show up on this day and there would be an election and no one would understand how that came about. So councils have been expressed more interest in transparency. So the original rule, the change was to have uh, speeches made on the second Tuesday in November and then votes on the third. And that required an extra meeting that folks thought may not be necessary. So the rule was changed two years ago, maybe three, to provide that if you were interested in running for mayor, you had to put a statement on hotline prior to the second Tuesday in November expressing your interest for mayor or mayor pro tem. And so the idea is that the community now has had a week to understand who has offered to be, who seeks to be nominated. Um, the rules provide that you can only be nominated if you've previously stated your intent uh, on, before the, the second Tuesday in November. Of course, the rules are council rules and they can be suspended by majority vote of the council. So they don't lock anything in, but the, the intent of these rules is to provide transparency in this process uh, in, in some manner. Thank you, Tom. Anybody have any questions? Adam? Tom, when was that told to us? I'm not sure what your question is, Adam. So I never heard that just as a rule? Yeah. So not knowing the rule, not saying I was ever gonna put up myself up for a position, but just for the transparency itself to the council members, I, I personally didn't hear about that rule. So I'm just wondering if anyone else didn't hear about that rule. Sure. And maybe that's something that future councils should be informed of upon their election. Okay. So Adam, um, I would encourage you to bring that up at the retreat yeah. and yeah, we can always um, evolve our rules further. Any other comments? Junie? 
I think I would just like to echo some of the things that's happening in here. There seemed to be a little bit of confusion. What would it mean to suspend the rule? Would we still have the mayor elected tonight? And if that were to happen, would Mary and Aaron come forward? Would other people on this diocese come forward? Well, um, Tom, could you respond to um, what could happen? So you can, of course, suspend your rules by a majority vote. So you can do that. I, I, I'm very quickly reading the charter to say whether or not you have to elect a mayor tonight. I don't believe that's a requirement in the charter, but I want to make sure before I say that. But you could, if five of you agree, vote to suspend the rules and allow additional nominations. All right. Is um, Mayor Bay? I personally am happy to move forward with the nominations. I think that um, Sam is excellently suited. I also, you know, this might not be popular, but we're sitting here talking about white males. I'm guessing you two have pretty different backgrounds in terms of your race. I'm pretty sure you're born in different states. I'm pretty sure you have have different income levels. I'm pretty sure you have different values. I'm pretty sure that you went to attended different schools and studied different things. I'm a white female, but I'm also Jewish. Uh, you guys have pigmentation that you can't help, and you have genders that you can't help, but you're being lumped into the white male. I mean, every single race on this planet has in some way been <laughs> Had, had something horrible happen to them at some point in our history. So for us to be lumping you as white males is just, I'm sorry, I've, I've had it. It's, it's obnoxious. You have completely different backgrounds. So I'd be honored to see you both. I think you come from both different political backgrounds. Uh, I think that you'll both represent us very well. I think you have um, a lot of brains, and I, I like that you actually think through a lot of the things that are in front of us. So I would be thrilled to move forward with this process. Would anybody, uh, Mark? Yeah. I think there's a misunderstanding of the implications of what we do here tonight. Uh, this is a collegial body of people. Nobody's voice is going to be suppressed based on who we elect as mayor or mayor pro tem. Uh, no one is not going to be heard. Uh, I think uh, the individuals who are standing for mayor and mayor pro tem are fully qualified to do so. Um, they've had experience on council. They will be able to adequately run the meetings and organize the affairs of, of the council. I just don't think it's going to be a problem for anybody on this council to make their voice heard based on who is serving in those offices. Any other comments, Aaron? It, well, I'm, I'm also fine with moving forward tonight. Um, yeah, I do think that the, the folks who, that Sam and Bob who put their names in will do a very good job. And Mark, that was a point well taken about the, these roles. Um, these roles are uh, not enormously consequential. Having been mayor pro tem myself a couple of years ago, you do get to help oversee the, uh, the schedule and the agenda at the, um, the weekly um, CAC meetings. Um, so there, there's, there's some role there, but uh, fundamentally this is a, it's a council of equals. Um, and as mayor, you get to call on who goes first and who speaks next. It's kind of a traffic cop role. So um, that said, I mean, I would love to have some um, additional representation in, in terms of um, uh, gender diversity and, and, and ethnic diversity on our leadership team. But uh, folks have to actually want to be in those roles for us to vote for them. Um, I'd, I would, I'd, uh, Mayor Bay, um, I just have to respond a little bit. I mean, I do feel like as a white male, that role carries a great deal of privilege that I and I think the rest of us have benefited from enormously throughout the course of our lives. But um, it obviously doesn't, it's not everything. And I do think that the two gentlemen in front of us tonight will do a, a good job in those leadership roles over the next year or two, depending on the length of the term. Thank you, Aaron. Any other comments? Rachel? I will um, echo Aaron's sentiment. And I, I have a, a question, I, I'm not sure of the etiquette, which is um, part of why I will not be putting my name forward for mayor because I'm learning and I don't feel that I would be doing uh, 
boulder any favors by trying to take on a uh, higher leadership role before I really understand um, exactly how to run meetings. But uh, just as an etiquette question, if, if we were to suspend these rules and would anybody else put their name in? Like, can I, can we just figure that out and then maybe go from there? Does that make sense? Like we're talking yeah, about suspending and I'm wondering if. That makes sense. Um, any other comments? So I, I'll, I'll comment. Um, so a couple of years ago, I did put in my name to um, for mayor, and um, things have changed in my life um, personally. And um, I have um, the the role of mayor. Um, although, as Aaron said, is um, we're all equals up here. Um, does require a whole lot more time um, that I. Um, I'm not willing to sacrifice. And so, um, but I will say this, one of the things that I will bring forward at the retreat is um, the idea of what I'm terming power sharing, but as we're all equals, um, it would be the appearance of power sharing. Um, but um, to share in the um, leading of meetings, and we cannot um, share the leading of a business meeting, but we can share the leading of study sessions. So I will bring that forward at our retreat um, to our, our my colleagues to um, for consideration. And um, so I hope we can do that. And um, the other th there are some other things that I would like to see happen, but um, they would require um, a charter change. So that might be something else I bring forward at that time. Um, but. At this time, I would not uh, put myself forward. Any other comments? All right, then. Um, I will open it up for nominations. I'm going Mark. to try again. I nominate Sam for mayor. Um, I don't believe a second is required. Is it? I don't think it is. OK. It's not. No. OK. Um, all right then, um, any other nominations? All right, so um, Sam, you're mayor by acclamation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he needs to give a little speech that we have to hear what he intends. Well, so let's, let's um, do we wanna go through and, um, and elect mayor pro tem and then have each of them give speeches? Would that be okay? Yes. All right then, um, so would anybody like to nominate mayor pro tem? Mayor Bach? I will nominate Bob Yates. All right, Bob Yates, any other nominations? Bob, you are Mayor Pro Tem by acclamation. So um, congratulations and let the speech making begin. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, can you just at least have a vote? Just everybody raise oh. your hand. Oh, okay, so it's, we don't have to do it by acclamation. Okay, well, sure, I mean, we'll have. Yeah, you're electing a mayor. It would be nice if everybody just voted. Okay. So there's a record that it was unanimous. All right then. So, um, so everybody um, voting for Sam for mayor, please raise your hand. And the vote is unanimous. Um, everybody for um, Bob Yates for mayor pro tem, please raise your hand. And it is unanimous as well. Thank you, Mary. All right. All right. Well. I, I put my policy initiatives out in the hotline post that we talked about earlier, and that's not really what I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about my approach to um, serving as mayor. Um, and the main, the main reason that I wanted to be mayor this year was to facilitate conversations within council and with the community. Um, Boulder's residents and businesses have many different diverse values and aspirations for the future, and some of those conflict with each other. And in a conversation with Suzanne Jones last week, she gave me some good advice, which is to focus on the word we. And we on council are each representatives of the whole community, which elected each of us. In the best world, we will treat each other with respect, collegiality and kindness as we shape the policies of our community. There will be differences of opinion on council as there are in our community, which is a healthy thing. The trick is not to be disagreeable as we disagree. 
Diversity of all kinds produces strength and resilience, especially when the diversity is expressed collaboratively. We have a pretty unique setup on our council. The mayor is a member of council and has no more or less standing than any other council member. The function of the mayor is simply to facilitate the council discussions and to represent Boulder to the outside world. But we all represent council to the community and the world and not just the mayor. Um, as I become mayor, I commit to valuing everyone's input, to be fair to all council members and members of the public, and to strive towards efficient meetings that do not wear out council and the community. <laughs> Furthermore, I can't do the job without all of your help. I will hope to share the load as much as possible, including committee assignments, travel to conferences, and if we so agree, to leading study sessions, um, each of us leading study sessions. This is one of the most diverse councils ever seated in Boulder, and I think we can do great things, treat each other well, and have a great experience. I look forward to serving with you. I really, really look forward to serving with you. And I will say to the community, I do understand your concerns with racial and gender diversity. This happened to be the way that the people with experience and the people who are willing to serve ended up this year. But I hear you, and I think we all hear you, and we understand that we can do better. And that's my intention is to listen to that message and to try and reflect it and to try and make sure that all of council hears it and reflects it as well. So thank you for putting the trust in me to do this job. I'll need your help. And I'm really excited to serve with you guys. So thank you. Well, Sam, I'll just note that, uh, well, you're one amongst equals, you do get to do a lot more ribbon cuttings than the rest of us, so. That's where sharing the load comes That's in. Right. <laughs> Enjoy that. And groundbreakings. That's right. Well, I can't say it any better than Sam just did, so I think I'll quit while I'm ahead and say that I agree with Sam, and I look forward to working with each and every one of you. All right. All right. <laughs> 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 it might be in the chart. Up. Your next item is the 2020 policy agenda. So Carl Castillo, who is the senior policy advisor in the city manager's office, is gonna be presenting this item. Carl. Thank you, Jane. Congratulations to all of you. And I do mean all of you. Of course, to the mayor, to the mayor pro tem, to the new members, and just all of you for being part of this new council. And uh, just a word, I am always so inspired by what you commit, what you commit and the time you put in. Um, it is uh, a big part of what keeps me uh, feeling like this is a, a really meaningful part of my life, and I know that you guys are putting a lot of your life into it. So thank you again, and congratulations. Um, so tonight's item, as you all know, is an opportunity for all of you to provide comments on the proposed 2020 regional, uh, I'm sorry, uh, City of Boulder Regional, State, and Federal Policy Agenda. Um, as you'll recall, council asked to change this from being merely a legislative agenda to a policy agenda to reflect the fact that a lot of the policies we change aren't just done in the state house, either at the Capitol, in DC, or in Denver. And we included regional because we have a lot of regional efforts that we work on. So it's just an attempt to have all of your external policies documented in one, one document um, and that of course, you're not gonna get it all in there, but as much as we can think of, so that it can inform and direct those advocacy efforts that we make <clears throat> when we are involved in those um, arenas. So uh, I wanted to start off by just reflecting on the successes that we had in 2019, and there were many. Um, as you know, you adopt uh, state legislative priorities in addition to the many positions. 
Last year, you had five of them, and all of them passed. Um, that started with the mobile home parked and oversight bill, um, the greenhouse gas emission goals, uh, local option for minimum wage, fixing the uh, mistake that was made with in the uh, local government division of PARA, and extending tax credits for electric vehicles. Those all passed, um, which were major successes. In addition, some that weren't listed as priorities also passed, such as the red flag law, the extreme risk protection order that allows uh, guns to be taken away from, from people who are are, are a danger to society after due process is, uh, has uh, been provided. Of course, we had the major reforms to the laws applying to the oil and gas industry. We had PUC reform, which now includes um, the social cost of carbon is now incorporated and now uh, to be considered for all plans that they approve. And we had um, increased penalties for serious bodily injury uh, when, um, when when is caused to vulnerable users, um, vulnerable road users, excuse me. We also had some administrative successes, um, working closely with the Colorado communities for climate action. We had the adoption of the low emission vehicle standard, and, and a few months later, we had an adoption of the zero emission vehicle standard. So all in all, it was a fantastic year. Of course, we cannot take credit for that. We were part of it. I would say if anybody deserves credit, it would be our legislators and specifically our delegation who are part of leadership. So we've done it before, but I'll say it again here. We owe them a great debt of gratitude. And luckily, they will continue in 2020 to represent us. So that continues to be Casey Becker as Speaker of the House, Steve Fenberg as uh, Majority Leader of the Senate, and Edie Houghton as the Majority Caucus Chair. Um, we also continue to be well represented in the executive office. So of course, we have Boulder's own Jared Polis as governor. We have Will Torr as the Colorado Energy Office director and John Putnam as the CDPHE director of environmental programs, which is essentially the part of CDPHE that is in charge with implementing the greenhouse gas uh, mandates that just came out of, of the state house. Um, so some of the you know, one thing I don't have here today is our lobbyists. Typically, we have Will, Will and Adam, Will, like, uh, Will Coyne and Adam Mike Burke. So you won't get to hear their firsthand uh, forecast for the uh, for the General Assembly in 2020. But I will tell you that um, uh, what I'm hearing from them and others is uh, family family leave will be another priority. You you can expect that to come back. The issue of making sure that there's paid family leave to care for newborns, receive treatment for a major illness or uh, somebody who needs to leave a relationship marred by domestic abuse. That will be a priority that is being considered. There will also be, um, as you know, the governor has proposed making it a priority of receiving funding for preschool, uh, more funding for preschool. So that's something that you can expect to be um, uh, among the many priorities that are being considered. Finally, transportation funding. This is a really challenging one. We all know that we had a statewide measure that was not successful um, and, and many of us feel like we're beating our heads against the wall when it comes to pr providing new revenue for transportation. But what we can expect to see is a bill that would empower the metropolitan planning organizations, in our case, that's Dr. Cog, the Denver Regional Council of Governments. It would essentially give that body the ability to levy a tax within its jurisdiction if its voters supported it in return for um, promising and spe specifying a certain amount of transportation projects that would be provided. City of Boulder does not have a position on this. As I've mentioned before, there are some concerns about it, but nonetheless, it's something I want to give you a heads up on that. It is going to be considered as far as transportation funding goes. Um, yeah. uh, Pardon me, Jacob. Question? Yeah, Sorry, can, just on that. Is that the one that's coming up on the 2020 ballot? Because I heard Governor Polis was on NPR the other day talking about it and saying that there was going to be some, a fourth try on the twenty on a new ballot. But yeah, I don't know if that was twenty twenty. Uh, I don't think so. So the way it would work, this EMPO, as it's refer referred to, empowering the MPOs, it would pass through legislation. So during a legislative session, the state house would say all MPOs, including Dr. Cog, can choose to refer a measure to the ballot. So in our in our case, you know, if it passed, Dr. Cog could choose and ref to refer a measure to the ballot on November 2020. I don't think that's what the governor was speaking about. Okay. And um, frankly, I'd be really 
I, I'm really not sure w w what, what that was about. He was talking about a new bonding thing, and he said it was more of the same, and he thinks it should come off because. Oh, yes. But there, it was, I didn't right. know this was. There is a, um, a legacy of a previous bill that had required that the voters considered um, allowing the state to bond for a certain amount of money for transportation. Yeah. Uh, we've been opposed to that in the past because it, it's, we basically don't think that there should be money taken away from higher ed, K through 12, human services, unless there's new revenue. That measure, if it continues to be referred to the ballot, which currently it's self-executing, mm -hmm. but it'll probably be rolled back, um, would in fact give the state house the authority to bond for transportation money, and it would basically require the, the funds to repay the, the bonding to come from at the expense of other state priorities. So Great. I think that's what he was talking about. Okay, thanks for clarifying. Yeah, and please do interrupt me as we go. That, that, that's helpful, and thank you for that question. Two other bills that are, that are relevant to the city that uh, probably are gonna come up. Um, one has to do with an anti-immigrant piece of legislation that was passed in 2003 won't go into the details, but it's called the Secure and Verifiable Identity Act. It essentially prevents <coughs> local governments from deciding what identification they accept before they provide services. It was branded as post 9-11, you know, terrorist security, but in fact, it's <coughs> a way to discourage local governments from being able to uh, provide services to homeless, to undocumented immigrants, uh, without having to worry about liability. So that's something that, uh, it's not one of our priorities, but I'll mention it because I do know that that is likely to come up. And lastly, you've all heard that there's been an effort to, uh, uh, and, and the city has officially supported, considering alternative financial investments, uh, specifically public banking and credit unions. Um, I do believe that that may come forward, probably in the more minimal form of allowing cities to invest in credit units, which is a significantly lower uh, burden, or I should say, task than asking for legislation that would uh, allow us to create public banking. Uh, it could very well be considered a sequential step, so it's not like you'd have to consider one versus the other. Um, one other thing I'll say about 2020 is we had kind of a mess last year in terms of tons of bills that were introduced and that the uh, Senate had to wrestle with at the, in the last, uh, the last days. You might recall this was, um, there, there was many issues that this, this created, but um, bottom line is this year, leadership is saying they're gonna make a, a significant uh, reduction in the amount of late bills that they're going to allow. So I, I take them at their word, so uh, it's something for us to know because in the past we've always felt, well, if we have leadership on our side and we have a good idea, we can introduce this after the, uh, the deadline. Well, that's certainly not something that we should expect this time. Um, Another big dynamic is we had a tremendous amount of climate and energy bills passed last session. Um, that's part of the amazing successes. This year, we're gonna, of course, see more of them, um, but we're gonna see a big shift of that attention going into the administrative executive realm where the, the law basically said, create this greenhouse gas goal, uh, uh, make sure that it, it takes place in all the sectors of the economy. It has some specifics for uh, energy utilities, but it has, there, there are now needs to be rules adopted by the, by the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, the Air Quality Control Commission, Public Utilities Commission, all to make this meaningful at the diff different sectors. So we're gonna see a lot of work taking place there. And I can tell you that as, as a member of CC4CA, the climate organization, we're gonna be part of trying to influence those to make sure they are as protected as possible. Um, and then on the regional level, I think you know that Boulder County is considering a transportation tax measure, um, which is an alternative, I suppose, to the uh, EMPO, which is more of the regional approach. And they're considering one that would um, combine affordable housing uh, with, with um, uh, funding for transportation, which is perhaps a pretty logical nexus, but they're gonna be doing some polling on that. So that's something that you can look forward to hearing about and certainly have an opportunity to weigh in on. Okay, so moving on to the actual changes that are being proposed. I'm not gonna go through it all because there's a lot. You have it all in your packet. Um, they are highlighted in the uh, attachment A, um, any substantive changes from the previous one. Um, summarized in attachment B, um, they were reviewed and revised by the Intergovernmental Affairs Committee, which is composed of, uh, of uh, Mayor Weaver, 
and uh, Council Member Brockett and former Mayor Jones. I have to pause to say that. <laughs> um, it, most of the changes are minor changes to the wording of existing positions, or they are new examples of how we can reach our policy goals. So if you recall, our positions are kind of like, here's the goal, and then we have like these A, B, C, D as like specific approaches of how we can get to those goals. So a lot of the changes are new examples of how we, or, or strategies, if you will, of how we can get their goal. We also deleted a lot of positions, which is really just a reflection of our success. I mean. Uh, all the positions that were deleted are no longer relevant because we have passed laws that address the matter. And it's certainly healthy to, uh, uh, let, yes. Carl, I have a question. Um, with regards to um, one of the things that is still in here, I'm wondering, um, has any progress been made on the purple card and is that effort still ongoing? So the, the purple card being a, uh, a uh, identification that allows something short of full citizenry, but uh, uh, you might have to refresh my memory because I'm, the answer it is no, <laughs> but I don't even remember exactly <laughs> what it was. It was um, like a green card, but um, it came with a, um, it would come with an understanding mm -hmm. that the holder of the card would never apply for citizenship. Right, yep, thank you. I did want that to be explained rather than just say that it's, it's it, it, no, there has not been progress made on that is, is the answer. Someone else, yes. It, well, just, but it is still in our agenda. It absolutely it's still is still part of our, our policy. Our list. List. Yes. Yeah. Although I just found the language, I think it, it would it would neither mean eventual citizenship nor preclude eventual right. citizenship. Mm -hmm. It's kind right. of neutral. And that was, that was what, uh, why we supported it. Right. Yeah, I think that was the condition that council uh, requested that if we support that, we don't preclude the ability of these these purple card holders to uh, become citizens. <clears throat> okay, um, a few of the positions that I do that are brand new that I want to mention is one is the uh, support for implementing the greenhouse gas goals. That again is going to be regulatory. That's position number one. Position number three would have us ban or accelerate the phase out of hydrofluorocarbons. Position 21 would allow us to uh, use inclusionary zoning to include rental housing development. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Position 23 would have us support the uh, ending the mistreatment of migrants in the US uh, through ICE detention facilities as well as alternatives to detention programs. Position, and I'll talk more about that as well. Position 33 would have us um, protect the, uh, support the protection of the institution and the autonomy of municipal courts while accepting necessary state oversight that ensures consistent protection of the constitutional rights of defendants. And position 39 would have a support discouraging e-cigarettes and tobacco use, particularly among youth. So with that, I was going to begin summarizing the uh, recommended priorities. Uh, first one is to support legislation that would have us um, protect the interests of those who live in manufactured home communities. Um, as we mentioned before, HB uh, 1309 passed this last session. Fantastic first step. It basically creates an enforcement mechanism. So now if you live in a mobile home community and you feel like your rights have been violated, you don't have to hire an attorney, you can actually have the Department of Local Affairs to turn to and make a complaint. They will do an investigation, they'll issue violations and fines as, as necessary. Great first start, but the Sunset Review that was done in 2018, actually it was Sunrise Review, said that there's three things that we need to do. Enforcement, check, we've done it. Two, it says we need to make sure that they have an opportunity, that people who live in mobile home communities have an opportunity to purchase, opportunity to, to, to eventually own their communities. The discrepancy between the ownership by somebody whose uh, his interest may be purely looking at uh, making money, and those who are or, who own their own homes but don't own the land beneath it, is one that is a, is a grave concern to a lot of us. So having that opportunity to purchase is another one. That's one of the things that we're looking to address through legislation in 2020, and that we're asking to be supported as a priority. The second aspect of it is there's other protections that should be and need to be created to enhance the uh, livability and the fairness of those who do live in these mobile home communities. And that's things such as uh, 
clarifying what the rights, what, what it means to be retaliated against and, and be clear that retaliation is illegal, not just if you choose to file a, a notice of violation, but a variety of other things. Um, it, it means that um, how water fees are allocated to you needs to be transparent and fair and equitable. Um, that's been an issue that's a great concern to a lot of people. Um, there's a variety of other protections that, are, <coughs> that we're talking about on this. Let, let me just say at this point that this bill has not been finalized, nor would it be appropriate for me to say exactly what's in it. That's, that's really the uh, prerogative of the sponsor to make that final decision. But the, the, the gist of it is that um, we're asking you to support and increase protections for the owners of mobile, uh, uh, mobile, home, mobile home residents. Second one is to repeal the prohibition on local government bans on the use or sale of specific types of plastic materials or products or restrictions on containers for consumer products. That's the exact language that's in the law right now. So there is a, there is a preemption of our, our local ability and it's one of the reasons that we chose to apply a fee to plastic bags rather than to ban them all together. There are other cities including Denver who would like to ban them and uh, we would like to be part of an effort that is being led and that a uh, bill will be introduced to have us restore that authority for local governments to make to ban those plastics. The third item would uh, similarly restore our authority to um, regulate certain pesticide uses. Um, that was an authority that was taken away from us in 1995 and 2006, two pieces of bills. First it said commercial applicators weren't subject and then it said even private applicators, we can't regulate. Uh, we think that it's important that we have um, our local government officials make a decision about what is safe and what is the risk that we wanna take for a variety of issues in terms of pesticide use in, in the city. So that is the uh, third uh, recommendation. The fourth, I think, yes. Carl, I think we have a question. Yes. Sorry, Carl, I was trying to let you get through those, but uh, go back to the plastic really quick. Are, is that gonna, if we get that back, will we be able to also work on the whole issue with styrofoam specifically, because that's... Yes, so that problem. would be straws, plastic Any. bags, styrofoam, polystyrene, you know. Excellent, yep. so we'll have like full control again? Exactly. That's awesome. Yeah, and I, I guess I'll just pause and say that I think the chances are good that we'll get that. Great. Yeah. Um, fourth is, it is uh, support legislation that discourages e-cigarettes and tobacco use, especially among youth. Obviously, we've done what we can. We've taken some, some, uh, some action on that part locally, but it's much more important and meaningful to have that be statewide so that it's not people just crossing boundaries to uh, circumvent our rules. Um, and by the way, we do have a letter that we are prepared to send out jointly from the county and the university and the school district, because all of us in Boulder are uniquely impacted by this. You may know the statistics show that um, vaping by youth is worse in Boulder than it is in Colorado, and in Colorado it's worse than, than the national average. So we definitely have a reason to be banding together among those uh, who protect children um, for this. The fifth uh, priority would be to allow us to use our inclusionary zoning authority to require a permanently affordable rentals. So right now we're able to require that of um, a housing that's for sale, uh, but we have limitations on how we can use that for rentals. We, we are, and, and Tom of course uh, should jump in if I, I get this wrong, but it, we right now require in lieu funds that goes to our affordable housing fund. Um, there are limitations on our ability to say in return for development approval, um, we, we, you must have on-site affordable rentals. Um, and that is an authority that we'd like to have returned to us. Um, and we have a, group, a partnership with um, the Colorado Municipal League and others uh, to see that legislation like that gets um, introduced. Did I get that right, Tom? Yep. Great. So, um, I lastly. Hey, hey, Carl. Got a question from Mary. I have a question, just so I'm clear. Um, so this legislation would allow for the creation of on-site affordable, right. or for allow that. So, okay, so I'm confused and here's why. Um, I thought that it was possible, it was just difficult to um, 
to accomplish. So in the rent control preemption statute, there's a provision that says that the prohibition against rent control doesn't apply to, um, to voluntary agreements reached between a city and a developer. But then there's another provision, two sentences later, that says that um, the city can't withhold any development approval on condition of uh, stabilizing or rent control. So you kind of have, there's, a, there's, there's no case that says what a voluntary agreement is, but to enforce our affordable housing, we would have to refuse to approve a development application. And so since the statute clearly says that, so a small tweak to the statute can give us that ability. So our advice has always been, you cannot require on-site affordable rentals uh, because of this provision in the statute that prohibits us from withhold withholding development review. So uh, we're hoping that the legislature will help us with a, a little bit of a tweak to uh, give us that ability. So, um, but I'm, uh, would that then help us overcome? So there have been cases where, um, Violet Crossing, for example, where um, the developer was willing to provide the affordable rentals on site but then it fell through because it became so difficult to do in practice. Yeah. So this legislation would allow us to condition it, but we will would still be confronted with the, uh, the some ability. Some practical financing practical. difficult that, that, that some of our developers have. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I, I mean, when Carla and I spoke about this, very much like you say, um, it is a tool that we can use in situations where it might be possible. No, I just, yeah, but I just wanted to be clear on that. Yeah. And we've, we've had instances where developers wanted to try it, but we didn't feel comfortable because we couldn't require it. It, it would have to be voluntary on their part, and then it's not enforceable. And so the city's then not willing to give benefits if it's not going to be something we can require. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Tom. Um, so moving on to federal priorities, we always adopt um, two or three that stand out there. Uh, the first one is, is the one that we always have, which is, you know, we only have so much impact at the federal level. We're just one city, great, important city, but we're, we're just one city. But we have the Boulder Federal Lab, so we have the University of Colorado, so we have to make sure that we are standing for um, making sure that they're fully funded, retain the funding, and that uh, in the case of the University of Colorado, that the funding actually increases. So that is um, position number one. Number two is what I mentioned before. It's uh, ending the mistreatment of migrants in uh, U.S. Immigration and Custom Enforcement and Detention Facilities, as well as alternatives to detention programs. Um, one of the reasons, I mean, f I, this is important, I think, for a variety of reasons, because you've been hearing about it from, from your community members, about how, how distressing it is to hear about uh, uh, mistreatment, whether it is in the hands of ICE or in, you know, when they're actually in these alternatives to detention. But it also have, has relevance because our own Congressman Nagoose is part of a, um, he's a co-sponsor along with Representative Jason Crow um, of a piece of legislation called uh, the POD Act of 2019, which would ensure that, there, that congressmen cannot, or Congress people cannot be limited in their ability to go do investigations of these detention facilities. So they can see firsthand whether or not they are, you know, within the kind of uh, standards of decency that we would expect. So. I think it's it's always useful to have something directly relevant to what, you know, how we can lobby this. So, Carl, I have a question with regards to the language on that. Yes. Um, it says provide stricter oversight. Um, would it make sense to include provide and fund stricter oversight? Because it's one thing to provide for mm -hmm. oversight, it's another to fund it. And are, are you talking about? I'm talking. Um, I'll, I'll. You could refer to the page number. Of yeah, 392. Okay. And it is um, bullet A. Right. Okay. So the reason that word is used is because that's how the bill is written. Um, so that doesn't mean that we can't add our support for the funding as well. There's no reason that maybe, we can't do that. Maybe we want to talk to the sponsors about <laughs> including funding. Right, right. Yep, it makes perfect sense. And uh, assuming there's no opposition, that's something I can add to the, uh, I can add to it. Of course, it, it may very well mean a separate bill because you don't want to jeopardize one bill for the sake of uh, potentially an appropriation issue. But I will add that. Thank you. And then last is, um, 
promoting a greater understanding of the nexus between pesticide use and climate change mitigation and adaptation, particularly the ability of regenerative organic agriculture to reduce emissions of carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide and to sequester carbon. Again, this is particularly interesting to us. A um, couple of us just had a meeting with uh, Congressman Nagusa's office and learned that this is a bill that he's a package that he's interested in putting together. Um, it's basically to evaluate. There, uh, there's, there's a lot of belief that organic, pesticide-free uh, agriculture, when done right, can be a significant way to avoid the emissions of carbon dioxide that would otherwise come with pe heavy pesticide use and synthetic use, but also as a way to mitigate and sequester carbon. But there's still a lot of, of um, testing and piloting that needs to take place. Uh, so there is actually going to be a meeting of the Beyond Pesticides um, organization. It's going to be their annual conference in Boulder in March. Um, I'm sorry, it's in April of 2020. So we thought, what a great way to talk about um, partnering with Congressman Nagusa's office to put this package together, have him be a speaker perhaps at this conference. Of course, no promises are made. This is just something that we're interested in considering. Um, so, 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 so that is the, the third proposal for federal priorities. Um, one, one quick comment yes. on the federal priorities. Um, a number of federal legislators have been starting to circulate proposals uh, to make opportunity zone investments more transparent and to invest communities with greater rulemaking authority over what happens in those zones. Um, I would urge you to look at the possibility of adding that as one of your federal priorities to work with those legislators um, and create a, a system that's going to work a little bit better for Boulder, especially in light of the, uh, the great concern that Opportunity Zone has caused among members of the community. So um, are there any other questions? Are you done, Carl? I'm not done. Okay, go right ahead. Keep going. Okay, I will get back to that because I, I don't want to lose that. Um, so I just want to mention that a few council members um, were good about reaching out to me and mentioned that they have a few other suggestions they, they want to make. I know that council member Friend um, would like to suggest some changes related to gun violence prevention and capital punishment. Uh, Council Member Swetleg uh, regarding minimum wage, rent control, and health insurance reform. Uh, Council Member Brockett on community choice energy, and Mayor Weaver on resilience and safety regarding electric transmission lines. I have proposed responses to them if Council and is interested in, in, in exploring that, but I'll let them bring up the topics on their own. Uh, in terms of next steps, so your job here is to give me input, tell me what to take out, what to add, what changes to make. I'll come back uh, on December 3rd and uh, bring you a revised policy agenda. If things have gone like they've done in the past, hopefully I'll get your input right and you'll be able to consider it on consent. But otherwise, you'll you can always pull it off. Uh, that's also the same night that you'll be considering, council, considering a council committee appointments for a variety of your intergovernmental organizations which is very timely because there's going to be a lot of um, meetings that are coming up that I'd love to know who's going to be serving them. December 17th, we're going to have a legislative breakfast with our state legislators. Uh, so that would be uh, Representative Becker, Hooten, and Representative Singer, and Senators Fenberg and Foote. So we're fortunate to have a couple people who are not technically part of the city. You'll also be getting intergovernmental updates. I want to make sure that you always have uh, knowledge about what we, and that's any of us who are speaking on behalf of the city, are conveying as our interpretation of your, your uh, policy agenda, and always give you an opportunity to correct us if we're not getting it right. Um, and we will also do a check-in late in the winter, so I'd say probably around March, uh, to let you know about like what is actually being introduced and the unexpected bills that might have come up that you might want to take a position on. Uh, so with that, I just want to express my appreciation to all the people who made, who brought this agenda together. You see me as the, as the uh, person who pulls it together, but it really involves so many, starting with a council's intergovernmental affairs committee, um, staff throughout the city who've contributed greatly to this, um, our regional partners, and two people I want to call out particularly today that are here, uh, Taylor Raymond, who is your assistant to city council, who's helped me pulled us together, she's also going to be part of the team to help advocate it. 
and Jonathan Cohn, who's the Senior Sustainability Policy Advisor, who's worked on a substantial amount of your agenda, which has to do with environmental sustainability. They are both here, uh, Jonathan, in particular for questions, if you have any, and I too am open for any questions. Great, so questions from council? So, oh, yeah. Rachel, do you have one? Sorry. Happy to, I just, uh, etiquette question again. When do we maybe advocate for the proposals that we wanna make? Or so we do typically questions. Um, so we check and see if there's any final questions. So we interrupted, ask questions, then we check to see any final questions, then we have the public hearing. And then afterwards we bring the discussion back to council and we talk about it. So seeing no more questions, we open the public hearing. Do we have anyone? Okay, so um, I will call out the names of the next few people and let's be moving up to the podium. First is Carrie Christianer and Jim Hooten, followed by Dan Greenberg. And you will all get three minutes. Good evening, council members. Um, my name is Carrie Christianer. I live in Berthet, although I lived in Boulder for about 30 years. Um, and I'm a renewable energy advocate, especially in the area of local clean energy and community programs. So I'm very interested in, um, as, uh, as we all saw in, in the daily camera, um, uh, Edie Hooten's bill. And what's funny about it is that people might think that I'm crusading in the streets and saying, well, wow, the, the policy that I supported for years in California that is finally flourishing in California is, is coming here, it's great, you know, you know, send out the parade. Um, but in actuality, it's really, really critical that any bill like this gets it right, because also as, as um, uh, Jane and Tom have known, that I've advocated for programs that are as close to CCA as possible, but within the regulated space. And the reason for that is because to get true local clean energy at any actual scale, um, it, it's taken forever in California to get these programs off the ground, problems with credit ratings. Um, in fact, some CCAs are buying RECs from Excel, so up in Pete's and Carr in that area. You can, I can watch RECs that are being used in California for these CCA programs. So to get real boots on the ground, uh, local energy, which also helps with resilience, um, electrification and organized programs, it, it's going to be really critical that this bill um, uh, lets the PUC explore all options, CCA being one of them, do the fiscal impact, but then if they run into a problem with, the, for example, CCAs have to pay stranded costs. Just one example. So if we're gonna throw out all the policy making that all the, the advocacy community has done for the last five years, including clean energy plans, you're gonna be stranding the, 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 the actual generation that's being developed now. So, but there is a way to make it work. And I, I mean, I've been working on this idea for, well, as we all know, for about seven years, I've been coming in front of council um, to advocate for these types of programs. So the, the point is that I do think the bill will pass if it's, um, I think it'll pass, which is good in a way. Um, but we need to make sure that, that it doesn't mess up the greenhouse gas um, progress that we saw in this past legislative session. So we're not literally going backwards. Um, and we need to leave options open. Um, I also think that there'll be a lot of pushback from the advocacy community, like the main people that are down there at the PUC every week, every, at every hearing. They're not gonna be happy about this, at least the people that I know and I've talked to. Um, so leaving the options <coughs> open with a focus on local clean energy, I've, so I've supported that being through qualified facilities like the PERPA. Um, Thank and you, Carrie. I hope that you'll consider that. Thank you. Jim Hooten and Dan Greenberg, followed by Larry Milosevic. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, my name is Jim Hooten. I'm a 22 year resident of Boulder, a dedicated um, volunteer with Citizens Climate Lobby, and the husband of Edie Hooten, who could not be here today. Um, the city of Boulder has a long history of leadership in the fight against climate change. Many of you here on the panel and your predecessors should rightfully be proud of those efforts. 
One of those, of course, is municipalization. But regardless of what happens with Boulder's future municipalization efforts, it's sadly obvious that the long, expensive legal battle with Excel has deterred other towns from following our lead. Therefore, a more general solution for Colorado communities is needed. Therefore, I'm asking the council to support state legislation that Edie Hooten will be introducing to evaluate community choice energy as one of your top priorities. Community choice energy, sometimes called community choice aggregation, allows communities served by an investor-owned utility like Excel to buy their power wholesale from independent power producers or power marketers or generate its own power. This approach differs in a significant way from Boulder's municipalization plan because with CCE, the utility would still own and operate the poles and wires and deliver the electricity. Customer bills would still come from the utility, but the power would come from the source selected by the community. If an individual doesn't agree with the community's choice, they can opt to stay with the utility. The initial legislation that Edie will pr propose in 2020 will be a study to work out the financial and regulatory details of CCE. If the results of that study show the benefits that are expected, it would be followed by enabling legislation in a following session. The idea behind this legislation is not to be pro-muni or anti-muni, but to provide a path to clean energy faster for Boulder and for many more communities in Colorado. I urge your support. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Dan? Hey, Jim? If I, sorry, sorry. Anyway, Jim, I just want, thanks for coming and appreciate your and uh, Edie's work on this and I will be bringing this up under our discussion. Thank you. So Dan Greenberg, then Larry Milosevic, followed by Judy Amabili. Well, thanks for this opportunity. I'm Dan Greenberg. I've lived in town for almost 19 years. I uh, just want to say congratulations to the new members, um, to the new leadership, and um, thank you all for the sacrifices you made in, in guiding this community forward. I'm here tonight to ask for your support for Edie Hooten's Community Choice Energy Bill. Representative Hooten's bill would not enable CCE, as we've heard, but rather create two studies to assess the feasibility and desirability of CCE in Colorado and how it might be best implemented. If the bill becomes law, one of the studies will be conducted by an independent PUC-selected consultant and will, will assess the financial and technical feasibility of CCE in Colorado. Investigating numerous issues such as regulatory and policy considerations for forming CCE authorities, the magnitude and duration of exit fees that CCEs would pay, and likely electric rates CCEs could offer to determine the potential for cost competitiveness versus the incumbent utilities. The second study would be a docket at the PUC involving all interested stakeholders to consider the regulatory implications and legal impacts of CCE and to provide recommendations to the General Assembly regarding whether and how CCE could be enabled here. This docket would review the experience of CCE in other states so that if CCE were enabled here, Colorado could utilize best practices and avoid mistakes made elsewhere. I believe that CCE holds tremendous pro promise to contribute to grid decarbonization across the state at substantially faster pace and substantially lower cost than our utilities are likely to achieve on their own. CCE is entirely consistent with the proposed policy agenda for Boulder, but it is not currently amongst the six priority items on the agenda. I encourage you to pass a resolution of support for Representative Hooten's bill and to elevate support of this bill to be one of Boulder's legislative priorities. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Larry Milosevic and Judy Amabili. Uh, Councilors, my name is Larry Milosevic and I'm from Lafayette. I'm um, here tonight to speak from an external perspective on a state legislative priority that's worthy of your consideration. I, I too want to encourage you to support Representative Edie Hooten's bill to evaluate the idea of community choice energy, CCE, in Colorado. Community choice allows communities to purchase their power from an alternative wholesale supplier while the electricity is still delivered by the incumbent utility which continues to own and operate its transmission and distribution system. The motivation for studying CCE was to find a solution for the many Colorado communities with ambitious renewable energy and climate goals. 
These include the Ready for 100 cities that want 100% renewable energy by 2025 to 2035, as well as members of Colorado Communities for Climate Action, or CZ4CA. Allowing communities a choice of wholesale electricity supplier introduces competition that will likely allow them to reach their energy goals more quickly and cost effectively. But rather than just enabling CCE in Colorado, it is prudent to first study its financial and technical feasibility and regulatory implications, which is exactly what Representative Hooten's study bill does. CCE promises communities more choice and control over their energy sources, energy costs, and energy programs, and it merits serious study to see if that promise could indeed be realized in Colorado. Boulder should support the CCE study bill even as you pursue municipalization, because Boulder has always been a statewide leader in advancing the energy transition. This bill is about the potential for making great progress on energy and climate throughout the state, in dozens of communities that are unlikely to pursue municipalization and in a way that does not interfere with Boulder's municipalization effort. To summarize, I ask you to embrace Representative Hooten's CCE study bill as one of your legislative priorities and consider passing a resolution of support for the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Judy? Hi, um, I'm Judy Amabile, and I'm here with a group of people who are mental health therapists and they've recently learned that their reimbursements are at risk of being cut by 20%. And they have, uh, they're interested in a bill that would stop that from happening. So I'm on the board of the National Alliance for Mental Illness here in Boulder. And I'm also on the board of Mental Health Partners. I mean, I'm sorry, Mental Health Colorado in Denver. But I'm here today as the mother of a son with schizophrenia <coughs> and co-occurring substance abuse disorder. If we cut the reimbursements for these mental health care providers, we will reduce the access to care, we will reduce the quality of care, and we will endanger people's lives. So I hope you will all really consider taking a look at this bill and getting behind it, because all over the state, we have a catastrophe of a lack of access to mental health services. And it is getting worse and worse. And a big part of that is that mental health care providers are not at parity with other health care providers. And we've passed a lot of parity bills, but we apparently don't really know what parity looks like. And if we want people to be in the mental health space as practitioners, we have to make sure that they are being reimbursed at the same rate as other practitioners. Mental health is a huge factor in a lot of the issues that people here in Boulder care about, including homelessness and incarceration. And we need to be addressing the mental health crisis in our state before people are in a crisis and after the crisis is over, but currently, we only treat people with serious mental illness when they are actually in the crisis. And the secret about that is that even then, they really don't get the treatment they need. Thank you. Other people are gonna get up and explain the bill that they're proposing. Okay. So, so I have a question for you real quick. Um, is this a federal bill? It's, it's a state. State, state bill, okay. And when did this, um, is it a cut or is it just not at parity? It's a reduction in the current reimbursements. And when did that happen? They've all gotten a letter just recently. Okay. You know, in the last several months. All right. That okay, thank you. What he said. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, Andrew Rose is next, then Renee Hamill and Philip Horn. Great, um, so Andrew Rose, uh, 1177 Four Mile Canyon. Um, so I've operated Boulder Emotional Wellness here for 10 years. Um, I've got eight intern therapists from Naropa. I've got nine extern therapists. Um, I got three supervisors. Our current census is 145 Medicaid clients. Um, just imagine a 20% pay cut. Um, what's going on here is Anthem, which is actually CCHA, which is the Medicaid payer for Region 6, which is what we're in. 
sent us a letter October 5th saying that our um, compensation rate or reimbursement rate, which has previously been 100% of the Medicaid fee schedule, is gonna be reduced to 80%. Um, that's huge, that's my mortgage, that's my student loan payments, um, my contractors don't wanna work for Medicaid anymore. You guys have a, a legislative priority, number 27, to oppose further cuts or policy changes to state and federally funded health and human service programs that negatively impact accessibility, availability, and cost of basic, basic health and human service needs. So it's already in your priorities to, to oppose this. What we've offered um, is we've had meetings with Anthem um, that have been unproductive. Um, we've looked into the class action lawsuit that was won by therapists in California. Um, I think it's a much more um, constructive approach to legislatively fix the reimbursement rate. So all we're asking for in this legislation is one line that says the Medicare mental health providers will be paid at 100% of the healthcare policy and finance fee schedule. So healthcare policy and finance has given up control of the reimbursement rate to Anthem and Beacon and Colorado Access and Rocky Mountain Health Plans in a way that makes us terribly vulnerable um, to pay cuts. Um, I, I have a contract, we're independent contractors. Um, have you, have, if you follow the Seattle Uber and Lyft case, there's no way for us as independent contractors to collectively bargain because they'll call us a trust. So we are at the government's mercy here um, to maintain expensive operations. I have to train therapists. I have to pay for space. So we're at um, 34, 34, 47, which is in city limits. Um, our, 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 our lease space is really expensive. It's almost $4,000 a month for me just to put therapists into offices. Um, I have to pay for training. I have to pay for insurances. So when you see that rate in the rate table, that right now is $104, which is still 74% of the Medicare rate, which is $134, that to see that cut to $83, is gonna put us in jeopardy for training and for delivering, and I'm talking about Medicaid clients in our city, the 20% poorest population. We got students, we got workers, all that kind of thing. So thanks very much for listening. And I, I follow up, you guys have the legislation in the council at Boulder, at your, at your email, yep. So, so one more question, I'm just trying to understand the context here. You said some group had given up price setting control to Anthem and you named some other um, provider, or sorry, insurers. What was the group? Healthcare policy and finance okay. um, is the Medicaid administrator for the state. And Singer and myself are gonna meet with uh, Laurel Carabazos, who's the administrator of Medicaid, administrator of Medicaid on, on, on the 22nd. Um, and we're gonna encourage healthcare policy and finance, which under federal law has the right to mandate minimum payments. Yep. Um, so we need your support on this. We're looking for a sponsor for the bill and et cetera. So thank okay, you. thank you, Andrew. Renee Hummel, oh, sorry, apologies. Can you come back up, Andrew? No, we'll go ahead and get it. I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Uh, just one question. You said something about Region 6 or something like that. Is it is this something that's only impacting a subsection of Colorado or is it a statewide reduction? In so all mental health providers are paid through these regional, um, they're called RAEs, regional accountability entities. The medical side is not. Um, so that's the parity issue, which is a federal law issue. Region 6 and Region 7, Region 7 is also administered by Anthem, that's Colorado Springs. There's over 300,000 members in Region 6 and Region 7. Regardless of that, every mental health practitioner is vulnerable to changes in our rate um, in an unregulated way, which makes it impossible to plan for anything. Okay, thanks. thanks. Anyone else? All right, thank you, Andrew. Um, Renee Hamel, Philip Horn, and then Ryan Burkhart. Hi, um, Renee Homo Boulder. Um, first, I just want to congratulate uh, the council, welcome the new council members, and I'm actually speaking on behalf of the Vista Village HOA uh, Board of Directors here. Um, manufactured home issues are one of the things I work on a lot. Um, 
we really want to thank the council for all their support of manufactured housing over the years, the legislature and the staff. Um, thank you, Carl. And um, your support has been so tremendous for us and the ripple effect to the whole state. I mean, HB 1309 that was passed that creates the new dispute resolution enforcement program is so important and I'm uh, just so pleased to see the manufactured housing issues um, high up on the, on the policy um, proposal. So thank you so much for your support and I, I hope that will you know, continue to have um, a high um, priority for you <laughs> as time goes on. And the affordability component uh, is also very important because people are being squeezed out. Um, at the fall forum that we had recently, uh, some of these elders who are talking about the rent increases, um, it, it's just heartbreaking uh, what, what's happening. So um, thank you for support on that. And um, I have to say, I, I'm just so happy with Boulder and, and these various policy things. There's so many important policy issues that you're working on here and these mental health people in the CCE, it's all important and um, just thank you so much. Thank you, Renee. Um, Philip Horn, then Ryan Burkhart, and then Richard <coughs> Andrews. Hello. First off, thank you to all the new faces. Can you lift the mic? Yeah, oh. sure. Is that thank better? Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Uh, my name is Philip Horner. Sorry, it says Horn up there. I want to welcome all the new faces. It's good to see you all. Some of you look familiar. It's nice to see you again. I am here as one of the mental health providers as well, trying to support some of this change that's happening. Um, I'm wanting to speak today to raise something to your attention. The Medicaid reimbursement rate for our county is being cut by 20% for mental health therapy. I'm gonna say that again. The 20% cut to mental health therapy. This drastic cut is already cu causing immense negative impact on the mental health availability of those with Medicaid insurance. To speak for myself, I am a director of a mental health clinic in town called Whole Connection. We have about 11 therapists, see about 95 people a week. This cut's gonna end up, I've already had to cut my pay. I'm actually back on Medicaid myself, trying to figure out ways to keep our existence alive till at least May, so I can let some of our trainees finish out their program. And at that point, I'm not sure we will continue. This is because administrative costs, liability, training, and the fact that we are not paid if our clients don't show up, which is understandable, and also just a cost we have to factor in. All these make working with Medicaid tends to be cost more. With the expected 20% cut to therapy, we're looking at more providers dropping Medicaid as an insurance they accept, which would more, more pressure on mental health centers, such as mental health partners, to see more clients, which they already can't see. There's wait lists of two to three months for some of these clients. I get calls regularly from people who haven't been able to see anybody. There's already movement on creating a bill that I think Andy talked to you about from Representative Singer who I've met with as well, and they're gonna be having larger meetings about this. But it's good to know this is impacting Boulder County and a few others, but greatly impacting this city. You've already talked with one director, I'm he's sitting here as another. We're looking at just, that's just 250 clients right there. People who won't be able to access mental health care, who wait months, who will most likely, in the end result, decide not to get care and end up either going, uh, having their own difficulties in other ways, end up in higher level of care, hospitals, um, and, and costing the city actually a lot more money. I'm happy to spend more time with all of you to explain this in more detail and how this law has passed to create some of these uh, unstable situations. Um, and I really hope that you'll consider looking over this more and discussing it further tonight. But please understand that Andy and I aren't the only clinics here that are being impacted. There are several others that do the same care, that saw the need and saw how much this population was not being served. And many of them will stop serving this population with this cut. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Philip. Uh, Ryan Burkhart and Richard Andrews. Uh, good evening. My name is Dr. Ryan Burkhart. I am the executive director of the Colorado Counseling Association. Um, I often spend much of my time representing the needs of professional counselors in Colorado, of which there are just under 10,000 professional counselors in Colorado. In total, there are 24,621 mental health professionals in Colorado. The largest portion of those mental health professionals are located between Fort Collins and Colorado Springs. So I'm here to speak to you about these Medicaid cuts. 
um, the cuts in our reimbursement. Um, I got into this profession because I wanted to help the most vulnerable in our populations. Uh, my brother uh, in 2008 was in a car accident, traumatic brain injury, and is now wheelchair bound and as a result is on Medicaid. Um, these cuts are going to impact our community in a very negative way, and I hope to explain why. Um, so I wanna step outside of my role as the executive director of the Colorado Counseling Association and advocate for my clients. Right now, how it works, some of those vulnerable client or uh, community members that we have are currently on Medicaid. There are about 3,000 Medicaid providers in Region 6, as it stands right now, who are trying to service over 300,000 people who are on Medicaid. Those 3,600-ish three, those 3, Medicaid providers are spanned between both private practices, um, community counseling centers, and also uh, group practices. Now, we've already mentioned, right now we're seeing a 10 to 30% shortage in community mental health centers. So we have a two to three month waiting period for clients who are on Medicaid to get in and receive mental health treatment. We were concerned about this, we sent out a poll, and 97% of our members of the Colorado Counseling Association have said that this will most likely impact their ability to take Medicaid clients. What we are expecting is we will see a dramatic decrease and mental health providers who are willing to see Medicaid clients after a 20% reduction in their reimbursement. So what will happen is we will have a mental health access crisis in Boulder. The 300,000 people who are on Medicaid will see a drastic reduction in the number of people who can provide mental health services to them. Now it is illegal in Colorado for anyone who is not paneled as a Medicaid provider to provide Medicaid services to someone who's on Medicaid. So these individuals are stuck to only see people who will take Medicaid clients and you're gonna see a reduction in people and in, in, in counselors in Boulder who will, who will provide services to Medicaid because we simply can't stay in business. So what we're forecasting is a mental health access crisis in, in Boulder County as a result of these Medicaid cuts, a 20% reduction. So we need your help. We need your help in making this a legislative priority. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, next is Richard Andrews. And after Richard, Heather McLaughlin and Lynn Siegel. Yeah, my name is Richard Andrews. Um, I've lived in Boulder area here for 40 years and much longer than that in the whole region. Um, I'm an environmental scientist, engineer, and an organic farmer. Uh, first off, I want to acknowledge Carl right over here, super guy, and uh, very talented, and I, we recently met together with Joe Nagusa's office, uh, along with another exemplary person from city staff, Azrella Abernathy. She's in, in charge of the in integrated pest management and pesticide programs. That's primarily the focus of my comments, which I've handed out comments, copies to. Um, I definitely support what's been s included in the policy document, um, but I'd like to take it a little further, um, particularly on the, on the area of pesticide issues. Uh, pesticides are everywhere. They're in your food, they're in your water, they're in your beer, your wine your bread, everything. And you are being poisoned every day, and we don't need to let that happen in, in this area, particularly on our open space lands. So there are ways to correct that with the legislative process right here in our own state, city, county, and other jurisdictions. Um, I definitely want to encourage and link some of the issues that have already been discussed, and that is pesticides are definitely linked to climate change. They do kill the soil. They prevent effective carbon sequestration of the soils on which crops are grown. I'm a scientist. I've been reading and studying this stuff for years. I hope you can take that as a credible comment. Um, another area of crossover and the nexus is by some of the other people that have testified about mental health and health care. My own family is suffering from diseases that are definitely linked to pesticides. 
And I just can't let that happen and continue to happen. So I encourage you to take strong efforts in encouraging the legislation that has been proposed. One of those is, of is bringing the linkage or, or the preemption clause and eliminating from the state law at the moment. Uh, another is, uh, is in fact strengthening uh, legislation on the class of pesticide called neonicotinoids, which are neurotoxins. They don't just kill insects, they kill us too, because they, are, they have neurotoxin effects on us as well as endocrine disruptors. So anyway, um, I will stop at that. If you have any questions, I'm always available. Great, thank you. Uh, next is Heather and then Lynn Siegel. Hi, I'm Heather McLaughlin. I have lived in Boulder for 22 years and worked here um, for 20 of those years. I've worked in the school system, I've worked for nonprofits, and I've worked for the county, um, always in the capacity of a social worker and through that sort of a lens. I now um, am the executive director of the National Association of Social Workers here in Colorado. So now I'm working on behalf of social workers, clients and communities around the state. Um, but as a resident of Boulder, I wanted to be sure to come tonight to be able to add my support and that of the National Association of Social Workers to uh, the legislative proposal that's been put um, in front of you by Andy Rose. And uh, we have had opportunities to meet with Congressman Nagus's office, with Senator Fenberg's office, and with um, Representative Singer, and more meetings are planned. Uh, we participated this morning in the Colorado um, Coalition on Parity to have this conversation and move it to the next level. I do think I would just really urge you, especially as Boulder, when Boulder County a couple of years ago endeavored to determine what the uh, community priorities were for for health, what was the number one priority? Mental health. So I think that this is a time that you as city council members um, can really move that needle forward and help the community in terms of achieving what it set out to do through that planning process, which is address mental health. The way that you do that is ensure adequate um, capacity of those that especially offer preventive outpatient mental health. That is the bulk and the most efficient way. That's the bulk of the mental health that's delivered and, and behavioral health, substance use disorder um, prevention. And if we are to um, survive as outpatient mental health delivery persons, uh, we are going to need to have pay that is uh, that we're going to need to have parity as a part of that dialogue and we're going to need to have pay that enables people to live in this community and work in this community especially those that want to serve the Medicaid population that does have those additional concerns around issues of homelessness and um, co-occurring disorders and just can be a community that can have additional challenges we know that right now in Boulder and in Colorado we're facing um, epidemics with suicide and with substance use disorders, with opioid and other substance uses. If you cut the reimbursement to your providers, your master's level providers, your social workers and your counselors that are providing these mental health services, they will pull back and they will start to close their doors and you will lose that infrastructure. So. Thank hope you, you'll support Heather. it as a legislative priority. Thanks. Thank you. Lynn. Lynn Siegel, Mountain Heights. To, uh, I'm going to address CCA or CCE, but I, I, while we're on this thought still, th my understanding, according to what these folks said, is that there is a mandate. So if, if Carl can say, um, there, there is a mandate to keep this 100%, you know, like then I guess the city would be kind of standing behind that mandate or maybe that's a legal thing that you wouldn't even have to stand up to, you know, like, but it sounded like they need your help. So sort that out because, because the, 
this is my other issue, is affordable housing here. And my own affordable housing, which um, is permanent, I thought I hold it a mortgage, but I'm actually kind of in the rental situation. As I heard from a KGNU piece about early Denver development, where this person had a bunch of housing, and suddenly Denver, it was kind of a depressed city originally, and everyone came in and flooded a bunch of money, and their property taxes went up so much they had to, they collapsed, they lost their properties. Um, as Bob Yates himself said, um, when he said he had an office, and I'd just been to the office, and it wasn't there anymore, and I said, what's the deal with the office? And he said, my rent went up. <laughs> Our own city councilors are getting pushed out with rent. This is, this is like completely unacceptable. Um, it's interesting, I hear you say that you want permanently affordable rental to be concluded in inclusionary zoning. Um, and yet, mobile home homeowners are trying to purchase a permanently affordable, you know, they're trying to have the ability to buy, but you want renters to have permanently rent rental afford, I mean, there's, it's fascinating to me, the issues going on with the legislature. It's a grand opportunity, Sam, for efficiency, really. Um, now, regards to CCA. Um, the thing is, I've always dreamed of our municipalization as transactive energy, microgrids, trading energy between, and we have our poles and wires that we're gonna own, but this large-scale transmission could also be kind of a deterrent if other cities are seeing that as a route to go and more large-scale solar and large transmission type um, generation it, it takes off based on that because I'm seeing this as we're all gonna go to self-generation and we aren't even gonna be trading between cities. We're gonna be generating on our own and that takes money and so do transmission lines. Thank you, Lynn. Just saying. Okay, with that we will close the public hearing. We will close the public hearing and bring this back to council. Um, Carl, was there anything that you heard that you wanted to tell us about? And then I have a question for you uh, uh, from a process standpoint. Yeah, super, super quickly. Um, <clears throat> CCE is something that we have direction from council to support, and we actually have been supporting it. Um, and uh, certainly would be interested in taking any questions you have on that. Uh, the Neonex bill, which is a separate pesticide bill, is one that we have direction to support. We are supporting that as well. And that. So let's take a moment there and slow down. So. Can you explain to council that there are two bills being run, one yes. statewide and one <clears throat> which is the preemption and kind right. of flesh that out and do the same with the plastics? Sure, um, so from the pesticide perspective, what we're proposing is to restore local government authority to regulate pesticides. At the same, t and, and that's something that we have worked with uh, Senator Fenberg to have introduced um, and the PPAN, the People and Pollinators Action Network, we learned that there's also a bill that would restrict neonics statewide. It would, it would not make it available to uh, private uh, users anymore. It would no longer be uh, at your Home Depot for, for private use. Um, that is something that we've indicated that we would also support, and we think of it as a, an interesting parallel. In other words, you have a statewide baseline, certain things that you can't use. In this case, it would be no neonics. But in addition, we'd like to give local governments the authority to go further. The connection to plastics is that there's a, a similar type of um, dynamic there and that we're asking for a um, local authority to ban plastics, but there's also gonna be a bill that would restrict the use of uh, polystyrene, the sale of polystyrene. So that's- Statewide, a, right? That would be statewide. So in both cases, there is a statewide ban, uh, or I'm sorry, a statewide ban of a specific issue, one, one case plastics, that are one neonics, and then in both cases we'd be um, seeking to restore our local authority to go even further than that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then the last thing I would ask you to talk about for us so we can organize our, our discussion here is how is the legislative agenda used? So uh, just as a <laughs> as kind of background, like here's, here's what we have, right, in right. writing, and then how do we use it at the state and federal level when there's sessions going on? Yeah, um, so focusing specifically on legislation, 
it gives anybody who works, well, it gives a certain officials of the city the authority to represent the city to advocate for that position. Um, I have one of the few jobs, I think, that is dedicated, maybe not 100%, but qu quite a bit towards that. Um, everyone else, it's as time allows and as it overlaps with the work plan, council members and the mayor, of course, would always have the ability to do it. Um, but there's obviously a limit in our resources. Beyond just resources, it's our political, um, <coughs> there's, a, there's only so much you can ask of your legislators before they stop listening to you. And there's only so much that we can ask that we have credibility on that you know, there's a reason that the city should ask for. So we, um, just something to take into account always as you're considering any changes to make. Um, we also are members of many intergovernmental organizations. They are often more influential and we can influence them to take positions, and that includes the Colorado Municipal League, the Denver Regional Council of Governments, the US 36 Mayors and Commissioners Coalitions. So there's many organizations that we belong to that actually advocate for legislation. And so one of the ways that we use this agenda is to convince those organizations, or at least attempt to, um, and find other like-minded organizations to do so. We're always building coalitions. It's very rare that we just think that we can go to our legislators and make it happen. Um, so this has really given us the authority to build the coalitions necessary through informal coalitions and existing intergovernmental, and of course, to speak directly to our legislators and ask for their support. Great. Yeah. Sam, may I add something? Please. Just a little bit broader overview. When the legislature is in session, things happen very fast. None of us can, can anticipate everything that's gonna occur. This gives Carl the license to advocate for or against a bill that you've already decided your policy position on. If we have time to come back to council to ask, is this a good idea, uh, we can do that. But a lot of times we don't have that time. So this gives him the ability to do that. And also, uh, as you'll see later, uh, we get frequently asked to uh, participate in amicus, as amicus in various issues, particularly with the current federal administration. And uh, the, the legislative agenda if it's something that's covered in there, I have permission to go ahead and sign on to a brief. So it basically gives us the ability to implement your policy decisions in between meetings without having come to come back and ask you or just say no because there isn't a meeting in time. Yeah, and that last point is one that I just want to raise here. This, once we're done with this and we pass it off, this for the next year will guide how Carl and our lobbyists, we have two lobbyists who you have not met, but they um, are also charged um, by Carl with um, lobbying for or against bills. And a lot of times things move really fast at the legislature during the session, especially at the end. And, and you know, we will never have time to touch it and so the specific bills. So when we hand this to Carl, it's basically marching orders. And then I want to highlight the legislative breakfast that he called out on the 17th. That's another time that we give all of our state legislators a copy of this. And then we go over and Carl highlights the priorities. So, so here's a thought about how to organize the discussion. I've captured like six subjects that people have brought up that we should probably touch on. And I would ask if people wanted to add to that list, here's what I've caught so far. The Medicaid reimbursement issue, um, an issue I'll bring up about safety culture that Carl mentioned for utilities, community choice energy, um, refrigerants and methane leaks, and then the opportunity zone. So those are ones that I have now um, captured. Are there others that people would like to bring up? I know. Rachel, were you? So, so just to let me know you want to speak, just put a finger up. Oh, there you go. Uh, it, it, and then you may. Carl mentioned that I had a couple things to add. Did you mention yes. Uh -huh. uh, gun violence prevention. Okay. And um, death penalty. Okay. And we will talk about those in order. Yeah. Uh, Mary's next, then Adam. So additional um, language in under the human services and human rights area and um, also under the transportation access. Adam? Statewide uh, minimum wage increase to $15 an hour and the removal of the prohibition on rent control statewide. Okay. Okay, anyone else? Okay, so one thing I will say about the way this discussion has gone in years past 
is people kind of wax poetic about why, but if we're all generally in agreement, we don't need to wax very poetic because we have a lot of subjects here. So, you know, I bet we'll be in pretty good agreement on a lot of these, and we'll ask for Carl for feedback at the end. We will see this again on consent on December 3rd. So just FYI, this is our one time to kind of take a crack at it. Um, but we, when it's on consent December 3rd, if you see something that didn't get captured or you don't like, you can send in a note and we can talk about it then. All righty. Well, why don't we start with the ones that were kind of already teed up and Carl told us are in there, the CCE subject. Does anyone have any thoughts on that, Aaron? Yes, I posted that on the hotline. So thanks for that, Carl. I, I know we do have it currently in our agenda to support that, but I just wanted to um, give us the opportunity to specifically support uh, Representative Hooten's bill that she's bringing forward. So is that something that we could maybe, if uh, Council's interested, to have a resolution on at a future meeting? Uh, you certainly can. Okay, so I would, I would put that out as a, as a step that we could take in support of that. Yeah, and I had spoken with Representative Hooten about that as well and suggested that when the bill is introduced, which I think it's one of her five early ones, that we then take up the resolution. So it might be early in January or something like that. Is that good? Yeah, are other folks amenable to that approach? Thank you. So the one comment I had, the, the one argument against CCE that's been floated has been that it would somehow slow down the progress that Excel is making. And I think you can make sure that that doesn't happen by requiring that it, anybody who, any community who subscribes to a CCE has to have at least as clean of an energy mix as Excel has at the time. So that way you could add that caveat so that for sure, any CCE contracts added would be as clean or cleaner than where Excel's gotten to at that point. So that's just a comment. We can see how that goes. Um, okay, uh, I think uh, that one's done. Um, Mark had brought up the opportunity zone. You wanna talk about that? I don't have that much more to say um, other than uh, there's been a lot of legislative conversation about it um, and including from representatives of, of some of the more disadvantaged communities who don't feel that they're getting a fair shake from the Opportunity Zone. Um, and the lack of regulation concerning the Opportunity Zone and the Opportunity Zone investments is a little bit scandalous to me. And if there is a good federal proposal to make that process more transparent and to invest communities with more rulemaking authority over what transpires in the Opportunity Zone, uh, I, would, uh, I would support that. Carl, do you want to speak to that? I, just very quickly, we can do that. We can, we can indicate support for that, and I understand what you're saying. Okay, great. Yeah, I think that's a timely thing. It wasn't there last year. Everyone thumbs up on, on that? Okay. Um, next, I want to go to something that is in our um, legislative agenda, but I'd like to see if we could make it our fourth federal priority. Um, so one of the conversations I've had with Congressman Nagoose is around regulation of both refrigerants and methane, and we actually say something about both of those. And I believe that there's a good chance, and Carl, maybe you can check with him to see if this is true, that um, we've had several conversations between me and others in his office about introducing a bill to do that, and it may just be HFCs or it may include methane. So if that's a, a possibility, if Congressman Nagoose has a timeline on that bill, I would like to suggest that we add it as uh, the fourth federal legislative priority. Um, just for background, these refrigerants and methane have hundreds to thousands of times the global warming potential, and they have short residence time in the atmosphere. So if we were able to control their leaks, we would have a much more short-term impact than controlling CO2 levels. So is everyone okay with doing that if Congressman Nagoose is going forward? Okay, thank you. Um, let's see this. Okay, I have one, I'll come back to that. Um, so the healthcare um, reimbursement for mental health. Carl, do you have any thoughts on, I saw uh, you writing a lot while they were testifying. I, I, was, I was given a um, suggested bill that has very clear, very simple language 
It's one sentence. I'll read it to you. The, um, it would amend uh, Section 25.5-401 uh, of the Colorado Revised Statutes to add the following. The State Department shall require the payment of qualified Medicaid behavior, behavioral health providers according to the State Department's Health First Colorado Physician Fee Schedule unless the rate exceeds the limits in 1B. I, in which case 1BI determines the reimbursement rate. So given that a very clear direction of council is supportive of this, I see no problem with adding this to our agenda. Okay. And, and especially the fact that Representative Singer is somebody that they reached out to, that's somebody we'll be meeting with. So, so this complies with principles already in the agenda, so do you want to call it out specifically? Or do you just want to support it for? Uh, I, I, th I think this would require a new position. Okay, great, thank you. And so you want to do that? Everyone on council support that? Okay, very good. Um, next, I have gun violence. Rachel. Thanks. Um, I have talked with Carl about this a little bit, um, and I'm not. I, I, <laughs> you know, I'm trying to get the protocols and etiquette here. Uh, but I think I'm looking at item number 42, if I'm looking at the current version. Um, and what my, PDF page number? Yeah, so I don't know. I think it was 38, uh, on, but that didn't comport. Somebody said 300 something, so I thought I was at a, four, at a 38, but that can't be right. Um, but on the scroll, that's what my screen said. So I think that um, gun violence prevention organizations are going to be pushing for uh, three-day waiting periods for gun purchases and for raising the purchase to age 21 for all gun sales. I don't know if there's going to be um, an appetite by the legislature to take those up or not, but wanted to see if we would support those. Do I need, do I need to explain that further? I think for me you need to explain it just a bit further. Okay, so um, I think that an example of this would be last spring uh, most of our schools in this region were shut down after a 18-year-old um, from Florida got on a plane and, and got off in Denver and purchased a, a gun. Right. And so people started looking at having the age raised to 21 for gun purchases and for some sort of a waiting period, and the consensus is around three days. Um, and that would, it would also have a pretty good impact on um, reducing suicides, which is what that young woman ended up doing. So how do you combat the 18-year-old military man who, or woman who's in the service who owns a gun, has been trained to have a gun? So I, I, I assume that there would be exemptions written into the, any state law that would be proposed. So you're proposing this for the state or the federal? State. State level, okay. It's the state that would be looking at this. Okay. And the three-day waiting period would be universal for any gun? I'm sure there would also be exemptions. That I'm would just be no, I think that's a good question. I, my guess would be if there was like a domestic violence situation, there's usually exemptions for things like that. Okay. I'm in favor of it, but um, Carl, do you need more guidance to? Um, I, I understand that there's already an age limit for handguns, but not long guns. And I'm seeing nods. So I understand that this proposal is to make it an age restriction on either kind of gun, and then the uh, three-day waiting period. Um, I'm not familiar with any legislation that's going to be introduced on this, but it sounds like there is a group that's advocating for it. Uh, so if council is supportive of it, I could research that and make sure that that's included. Aaron. And I wonder if our legislative position might be to support a waiting period so that if they come up with a four-day waiting period, we, wouldn't, we would be able to support that as well. So, I mean, I guess from my standpoint, I'm generally supportive. There are certain types of guns that, you know, are, are a little less um, like shotguns, for instance, are much less typically used unless they're some kind of combat shotgun. So. I'm generally supportive of this. Is everyone generally supportive of this, Mary? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Then why don't you do the research, and if you could, between now and December 3rd, if you could send us, just on hotline, the position that you're thinking of putting in, or? Um, I, I think I understand it. I mean, I, I think I can, I can capture your ideas and make sure it's included in the, the agenda. Unless there's specific concerns about how it's being proposed, I, I think I can capture this bring it back to, your, to you on your December 3rd packet. Very good. 
Are we good with that, Rachel? Yes, thank you. Death penalty? Okay, death penalty. So um, the criminal justice reform um, paragraph in here is, is sort of brief compared to some other sections. So in, in future years, I might have other suggestions, but I believe that the Colorado state legislature is going to be looking at abolishing the death penalty this year. They looked at it last year briefly and then sort of kicked it over to this year. And that is something that I would like us to consider weighing in on as a body. Um, I would recommend that we support abolishing the death penalty. Right now there's a state moratorium on it. Um, if, <laughs> if we need me to wax poetic, I'm happy to. I will just say that it is um, statistically highly racist in practice. And for that reason alone, I would support abolishing it. Um, and, and just two other small points on the paragraph that we have. And again, I'm assuming I'm looking at the current one. We say that prison populations continue to grow to record levels. And I think that the state prison population has actually decreased over the last few years from a peak in around 2010. Um, and then in terms of what's causing prison population, um, we say it's a hardline approach to drug crimes and actually prison admissions for drug cases have dropped 5% over the last five years according to the Colorado Division of Criminal Justice. So I just think we might tweak that language a little bit. I'm, I'm highly supportive of all the criminal justice reform. Um, just thought we might okay. make those amendments. And, and, and just to bring the rest of the council up to speed, I think you're referring to the paragraph that I sent you personally. So I don't know if everyone's seen it. So, so uh, item 28 is what I have. Is that what you're asking? Is it already in there? No, no, the language isn't quite there. In 28. Yeah, the, the um, it doesn't have all of that. Oh, um, it may have been part of what he sent to you. Okay, it, it might be something that. Yeah. You so I, I try to anticipate. Um, just trying to get ahead of the work, you know, it's, it's, I have basically responses ready to go if, if you all support it. And one of the responses I developed for uh, council member friend um, had some language. It sounds like you have some suggested changes to it. Um, it the gist of it is, you know, rep uh, repealing the death penalty in Colorado and, and she's correct that that would likely come back, come forward. Um, I had used some justifications why that made sense, um, but it sounds like you have some, perhaps some, some different uh, Factual uh, under if you could just provide that to me, um, and if council supports that, I'm ready to go on that as well. Do we have anything in the current legislative agenda that speaks to the death no. penalty? Okay, no. I'm everyone. How do you feel about repealing the death penalty? Thumbs up or thumbs down? <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. I think we have a, a preponderance of council that wants to support this, so. We'll go forward, and you'll work with Carl to get him the supporting language. Thank you. Great. Yep. Okay, Mary, human services language. Um, yeah, on page 391, um, in the new added language that says, conversely, the city will oppose the adoption of any federal or state policies that penalize non-citizens who have used public benefits, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I just wanted to find out from my colleagues and suggest that um, we add a couple things um, in addition to public benefits uh, or any federal policy that denies due process um, or um, that discriminates against economic status. Um, thinking about the, um, the current requirement or the recent requirement to um, for immigrants to have health insurance in order to be able to apply. So um, just adding those two um, additional items within that paragraph. Any, any policy that denies due process or um, discriminates against economic uh, status. Do you think economic status would capture your example of health insurance? Um, I, I, I would just say that that's the example I have in mind and leave it to Carl to come up with great, something. Great, great. <coughs> Council, how do you feel about that addition? Yep, okay, very good. And then okay. you had oh, yeah, transport. I had, I had transportation. Um, let's see, under, it is on page 412, um, policy 53, um, which doesn't have any subtext on it. Mm -hmm. um, but um, that says support policies and funding mechanisms that would increase affordable transportation access. Um, and access, um, 
is consists of, of several other dimensions. So I would propose that we um, add um, oh, uh, access contains in addition to affordable as one of its dimensions um, also consists of available transportation. So in other words, is there enough um, frequency in the schedule? Um, and then um, accessibility, which um, has to do with, is it close enough to people? Um, and then accommodations, is it in ways that people can understand to use it? So I would just propose to add um, affordability, accessibility, availability, and accommodation. Um, so just support those policies, um, just to cover, in addition to affordability, cover those other. Would it be fair to say that maybe we could do subtext below the heading to call those yeah, things if, out? I mean, that's the idea. If Carl wants to do subtext, that, that'd be great. It, it may be easier. And I, I know, I, I heard what you're saying. I can capture that. And then um, I had an additional one that I didn't, additional one that I did not um, bring up as a topic, um, but under the vaping, um, to, and I, I don't see the paragraph right now. Let's see, maybe it's above here. It's position 39. Yeah, okay, position, yeah, it's because I hadn't scrolled down far enough. Um, but under the items, um, increase the age, ban flavor, tobacco products, and then to add a D to that, um, which would be, um, and makes allowances for vaping as a cessation device, as a smoking cessation device. Um, so, perhaps I, so the, the idea is to make sure that we're not eliminating the ability of vaping as a cessation device. Correct. So perhaps yeah, th that's the idea, and however you right. So it. perhaps that gets added prior to. So you know, as yeah. long as you don't eliminate the ability of vaping being a cessation device, here's otherwise what we want to make sure is in place. Correct. Mary, do you, can we include an FDA approved cessation device? Device. What? Well, that, that was the argument that was provided during the vaping um, discussion that, um, in, in my view, a lot of the folks that were using it and um, as a cessation device and having success with it um, were disregarded um, because it was not FDA approved. Yeah. And so... Um, I think the evidence is that it's not actually a cessation device. There's a lot of evidence that more people uh, become addicted than get, then cease. Well, I, during that, that process, I spoke to a lot of people that had used it as a cessation device and had, so I'm just saying. Okay, it's up to you. I just yeah, want to make yeah. sure to clarify. Aaron? Yeah, well, I guess to the point that Tom made, I mean, obviously we, we all, th those of us who are on council a few months ago, spoke to a lot of people about this and went through several public hearings uh, at, at length about it. And I have to say, I found the arguments um, compelling that said that um, we should not be promoting vaping as a, as a smoking cessation device um, because it's not FDA approved and because of what Tom just said about the number of people who are getting addicted is uh, far greater than the number of people who are switching to potentially less harmful alternative. So I, I, I can't say that I would support um, adding that in there uh, based on the kind of what I learned and the conclusion I came to in our, our vaping discussions. Okay. Well, I will just add that I did read um, peer-reviewed papers that supported um, it as a cessation device. So, there's a lot of research. Anybody else want to comment on this? Um, so, I mean, I'm not wild about that necessarily either, because I read some peer-reviewed review papers that looked down at a whole bunch of other papers. So they were synthesis papers, and what they found is that more people became addicted when it's widely available. So I just don't know how you make sure that it's really being used as a cessation device and not someone who's become hooked on it mm -hmm. as they've started. Um, so I, I just want to be cautious about it. Maybe, Carl, if you could take a crack at something. Right. So a suggestion would be that we indicate that these are used by some as a cessation device. <clears throat> but that we don't endorse that, since it, apparently there's some mixed feelings on council about whether that it isn't legitimate for, but we indicate that in fact it is used that. Yeah. Our, the operational effect of adopting this is to say, tax it, no flavors, and higher age. 
So we're not restricting it by, by our actions to be used as a cessation device. So it's kind of a middle ground, rather, rather than say, we, we, we recognize that this is an effective cessation device, we just say it is used that way and, we're, and none of our proposals would pr prohibit it from being used that way. Would that work, Mary? Yeah, that would work. Okay. Um, so if that works for others. That works. Go ahead. Eric. I'd have to see the language. Not as an item D, maybe somewhere in the in the paragraph. So, so I say, Carl, go ahead. I, I guess a possible compromise would have Carl write the language and submit it as part of the second reading, and then we can review it and tweak it. And, and I certainly it? could, if there's any question uh, shared uh, with a. Uh, on hotline or something like that before to make sure I don't get this one wrong. Yeah, no, that'd be good. Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you put, folks. maybe if you put what um, you and Rachel work out and the vaping okay. on hotline, that'd be great. Sounds good. Then we have Adam, uh, minimum wage. Sure, um, so we now have local control over minimum wage. I'm just looking to take the next step. Currently we're in a very unique situation in that the unemployment rate is extremely low um, and we have an affordable housing crisis. So I think it's worth trying to be a little bit aspirational and look towards a $15 minimum wage at the state level uh, with the confluence of those issues hitting at the same time. A lot of housing affordability issues would be solved if people had living wages. So I guess there's a a counter argument to that, which is that the one size fits all is why we try not to do as much statewide and try and leave it up to localities. I just think of the rural areas, you know, that they, they really do have lower housing prices and they also have lower wages. So I would, I would ask if there's a way that we could craft it so that it, it's a minimum wage that's a fraction of AMI or something like that so that it, it takes into account the, the fact that wages are much higher and housing costs are much higher in the front range than most of the rest of the state. I'm definitely open to that. Okay. Carl, any thoughts? Um, <clears throat> the only thought I have is that the Boulder County Consortium of Cities, which is made up of a Boulder County and all the cities, will be taking this up as a topic, partly out of recognition that any one city without working with another city can be disadvantaged if they have a higher minimum wage. So another approach um, could also be to support um, a regional sort of minimum wage. So, you know, the, the rural areas clearly have a different situation. So the Metro Mayor's Caucus, for example, could certainly work together to have a uh, an IGA, which is what is specifically allowed to have a, a minimum wage adopted on the front range or along, you know, so, so that's another option that uh, you might want to pursue, but you tell me what you prefer. If I just, I, can I just speak to that? kind of separate from, from your proposal, Adam, I, I would love to get in something about the regional collaboration on a minimum wage. I mean, that's, that wouldn't be a s state or federal position, but this is our intergovernmental positions, right? right it's, a, it's a regional. So, yeah. so I would love to see us work with our um, other cities in, in Boulder County or across the region to institute a, a, a minimum wage across a region. So I'd, if people are, I'd love to get that in there as something that we feel like is a good idea. I think that's a really good compromise. Okay. All right, Carl, you wanna, is that clear? Um, yeah, absolutely. And uh, so when that bring, gets brought up, the consortium of cities, I will make sure we <laughs> convey that our council is interested not only in countywide, but perhaps more of a region-wide. Great, and I everyone on council, is that okay? Yeah, yeah, okay. Good enough rent control? Um, another one, rare opportunity. Um, so last year this came up, it actually passed through uh, committee, and then I don't think it ever actually got a hearing um, as a whole body at the legislature. So um, this might be the last opportunity to have it, and I think we all really appreciate local control, and we've heard time and time again from staff that we need every tool possible in the toolbox to help our affordable housing crisis right now. So. Um, I just wanna put another tool in the toolbox in this sense, and I think it's very important that we uh, support that at the state level. Thoughts? Carl, what's our current policy on rent control at the state uh, level? Our current position last, last session was that we supported it more just because it was a matter of local control, so we're always going to be supportive of having 
options. So we supported it at the Colorado Municipal League. It, it contributed to the, their supporting it. We also indicated uh, support to our delegation members of it. Um, it was clear that it was not going to pass, uh, so we did not testify at, at the uh, committees. Um, <clears throat> there's two things that we currently have that relate to this. One, we say that uh, we're supportive of rent control when it, when it relates to mobile home residences because of the unique uh, you know, split, split ownership that exists there. And we also have this inclusionary zoning uh, allowance. So what you're proposing would be just a broader, get rid of, you know, allow cities to do whatever it would be under rent control. Um, so we, we, there's no reason that if council wants to do this, we shouldn't write this explicitly so it's not just part of local control. So uh, Adam, to make sure we understand, um, are you talking about removing the preemption? Right. <coughs> okay. Mm -hmm. So. How do people feel about removing? So the preemption is when the state says the city can't do it. And so, Aaron? I'll just chime in. The, um, I think we've already supported it, right, in the, because it grants us more local control. And so I'm perfectly happy to get it in there because we want local control, not necessarily because I support rent control on a broad level, but, uh, but because it would give us more options. That's and, the reason I'm supporting it as well, yeah. just so you know. And, and but just then to make sure we keep our other couple policies in there that are the more targeted bits because they may be maybe what gets across the finish line this year. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think Carl's right. Leadership does not look favorably upon this, and so I don't think it will go forward. But I would like to see it explicitly supported in the legislative agenda. Anyone else? Okay. All right, so that brings us down to the last one I have on my list, which is one <coughs> that I've been thinking about in the last couple months. Um, so California had some terrible wildfires over the last two seasons, and many of them were started by um, their biggest utility, PG&E. And they were started because they had poorly maintained transmission lines and distribution lines. And so I would like us to have a position in our legislative agenda under resilience that talks about a state level audit that happens every few years of, um, of transmission lines because in our mountain communities, we don't wanna see this kind of thing occurring and when things occur in the nearby mountains, they can end up in our laps. And so this is a safety issue for Boulder, I think, a wildfire safety issue. And so that would be one thing I would put out there. And another thing that's related, just to get it on the table, is um, one of the reasons that we're pursuing municipalization is to be able to have control of the way our distribution system evolves, like Fort Collins has undergrounding, so they have eight times better reliability than we do. Um, Longmont has four times better reliability than we do because they have a significantly more uh, undergrounding than we do. And then there's the issue of the perverse incentives for utilities to do maintenance because maintenance doesn't add to their asset base and so they don't make money off of it. So uh, the other part would be to support legislation that asks the PUC to allow uh, municipalities to have input into the growth of their distribution system. So right now we have zero visibility into that and if there could be a way that we just get to review and comment on the plans for the distribution system, I think that would be valuable for all communities that wanted to do so. And it would result in better re reliability. Some of the things that I think about include microgrids, like how do we make ourselves ready to island neighborhoods when we have big floods? Um, how do we make sure that there's enough capacity for solar installation? Because that's often limited by the distribution system layout and so on and so forth. So without going on much more, um, starting with the the safety culture piece of it and the third party auditor. Um, is there any support on council for that? Yeah. Okay, Carl, I think I got a lot of thumbs up for that one. Is that something that you can add? <clears throat> I, I'm just gonna look towards Jonathan, uh, who's been helping me with this to make sure that he's captured your understanding and is prepared to help me. Okay. Two thumbs up. Two thumbs up. <laughs> okay, and then uh, distribution system planning input, just commentary about you know, like having a view three years ahead for what excels planning in our footprint and having the ability to comment on it in, in regards to our sustainability and resilience goals. 
People good with that? Great, thank you. Okay, that's all I have on my list. Is there anything else that we want to add or talk about? All right, that was a nice list of issues. Thank you. Discussion, you don't need a motion tonight, do you? I, I don't need a motion now. Is that good, Carl? Absolutely, yep, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. Can we do a time check? Okay. If, if the purple sheet is right, we still have two hours of stuff um, ahead of us. Only mm -hmm. I know. That, that's about right, yep. Okay. Well, I'd like to propose that we move something off because I'm not staying until 1130. So the National League of Cities, we can't move off, but that's probably five minutes because um, yep. that has to be done soon. CU South process check-in. I'm going to try and make that less than 45 minutes if we can because it's process and not um, w the 20 minutes that you have for um, NM in SMP is already done. So you can take that 20 minutes off. Oh, I did. Um, so we have 45 minutes for a historic plan. Um, and I'll bet that takes half an hour. Okay. So you guys think it's not going to be two hours? You think it's going to be one hour? An hour and a half. So I would suggest that we keep moving and then as we get close, we make a decision. Okay. I would just want to be respectful of staff too because if we decide okay. an hour and a half from now that we don't want to do CU South process update. We, they probably would rather know that now than 11 o'clock tonight. Jane, your thoughts? Well, Bob's certainly right that if it's 11 o'clock and we're telling a staff member to go home, that's not okay. But my hope is that we can do the historic preservation plan in a lot shorter time than we have indicated, and we'll get to see you south in hopefully a soon time frame. Yeah. Okay. We can do the amicus and NLC things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Next is your five year update to the historic preservation plan. Great, thank you. Um, I'm Chris Meschuk, Interim Director of the Planning Department, Assistant City Manager. Um, tonight, both um, James Hewitt and Marcy Cameron, who are our two historic preservation planners for the city, um, are here to present the five-year update to the historic preservation plan. And with that, I'll turn it over to Marcy for the presentation. Oh, yeah, I'll just, I'll just kick it off and um, start by uh, congratulating you all tonight. Um, Really happy to be here uh, on the first night of this new council and to talk a little bit about historic preservation. Um, just by way of history, you know, we've had a program in, in uh, Boulder, a historic preservation program since 1974, so it's a 45 year old program and it's, it's a diverse program. I think without further ado, I'll just turn it over to Marcy, who's got a PowerPoint for you and Afterwards, we can answer questions if you have them for us. Thanks. Good evening. Uh, my presentation tonight is about 10 minutes. So um, I thought I would take the opportunity to give a little bit of background information on the program. As James mentioned, it, um, it was established in 1974. The ordinance was written by Historic Boulder and adopted um, by the city council and it was really in reaction to the loss of some significant historic buildings um, that the community galvanized around and um, created one of the earliest preservation programs in Colorado. It established the design review um, and the landmark designation, and then in 1994, the demolition review for non-designated buildings was added. So over the course of the 45 years, um, we've designated 107, uh, 197 individual landmarks, 10 historic districts, and that totals about 1,400 designated properties, um, mostly located around the central area, which is the oldest part of Boulder. Um, our landmarks board is made of, of five volunteer board members appointed, to, appointed by council to five-year terms. And then um, we are the program, the two historic preservation planners, um, as well as admin and intern support. So the code 
chapter that we live in is chapter 911, and it talks about the purpose of the historic preservation program is really to protect, enhance, and perpetuate those building sites and areas of the city reminiscent of past eras, um, all in the spirit of enhancing property values, stabilizing neighborhoods, promoting tourist trade and interest, and fostering knowledge of the city's living history. And then the code goes on to say that the council does not intend to preserve every old building, but to strike a balance between private property rights and the public interest. So what does that look like on kind of a day-to-day -day business? Um, we review changes to designated properties through landmark alteration certificates. We review demolition requests for buildings over 50 years old. We designate or bring to you to designate new landmarks in historic districts. We review state tax credit applications, which is a great way to offset the rehabilitation costs of historic properties. And then we have our community engagement efforts. So that brings us to the creation of the Historic Preservation Plan, which was adopted in 2013 and funded by a certified local government grant. It was a bit unusual because we were a pretty mature program at the time. Um, but it was an opportunity to assess what was working and what wasn't working and to chart the course for the next 10 to 15 years. The community engagement um, during the process included a survey of recent applicants, open houses, and a working group, and it has helped establish priorities for our work plan over the last five years. The historic preservation plan is broken into three sections. The first is um, kind of a digestible summary of our program areas. Then it sets out the goals and objectives of where we'd like to go, and then has the recommendations of how to get there. Those recommendations are broken into program operation, resource protection, and then community engagement. So the scope of this five-year update was to document the process towards the goals made in the first five years, to confirm the goals and objectives, and to revise the recommendations so that they were clear and measurable. And this meant identifying recommendations that were vague or difficult to measure. Um, we would uh, propose the revisions and then identify the, the roles and the timeline as well as funding sources. The process started last September and the first phase went through the end of the year, which focused on the goals and objectives and um, documenting the progress. Then we moved into draft revisions um, in the first part of 2019 and brought the final revisions in April um, to the Landmarks Board. And here we are um, in front of you tonight. For the engagement, uh, as part of this five-year update, we had an internal coordination team comprised of um, representatives from different departments. And then we had a community working group of 17 people, which were really great to work with and, and a pretty diverse um, set of um, perspectives from uh, historic property owners to frequent applicants, representatives from Chautauqua and Historic Boulder, as well as a, a CU student and a past Landmarks board member, and as well as open houses and an online survey. So the first kind of piece of the update was documenting the progress towards goals. And in your packet, um, you have the whole spreadsheet of of what's happened in the last five years, but a couple ones to highlight is that we completed a grant-funded um, historic resource survey plan looking at what do we have documented and what are the gaps. We hired a consultant to prepare a National Register nomination for the University Hill Commercial District, which ended up not moving forward, but that has a lot of really great information about those properties and the history of, of that area. The Landmarks Board presented a lecture series for five years, um, picking um, films and giving talks, having walking tours, bicycle tours, and then um, focusing on the program, we made improvements to the demolition review process and updated um, various design guidelines. For the confirmation of the goals and objectives, the goals remain largely the same. Um, we revised them to recognize cultural resources in addition to um, architectural and environmental resources. We also revised it to increase the awareness of and importance of underrepresented, uh, underrepresented community histories, and then um, aspiring to be more proactive in the review and protection of um, the historic places in Boulder. So I've picked out a few of the um, 
bigger recommendations or the bigger revisions that, that were made um, with input by the Landmarks Board and the Working Group. And so the first one is to develop a plan to identify those um, potentially historic places. So that would be looking at what's already been designated and identifying the gaps of, of what's missing in order to tell that full story of Boulder's history. The second one, um, this list came primarily from the working group, but developing additional historic context reports, these different um, potential research topics so that we have a better understanding of Boulder's history. And maybe just to highlight a few, it's Boulder's indigenous heritage, African-American and Hispanic communities, women's history, LBGTQ history, there's the counterculture movement, science, outdoor recreation, um, to tell a broader history because we have a lot on the settlement of Boulder and even maybe through the 1940s and a little into the post-war, but really it's, um, there's a lot more there that we could um, that we could learn about. Uh, moving into resource protection, there's um, a recommendation that was added uh, to explore establishing a grant fund to purchase very significant properties that are threatened with demolition. Often, it's the pressure of a pending sale that will um, that puts the pressure on demolition. And if there were a fund to pause that or relieve that pressure. Um, it might save a, a historically significant building. And then um, community engagement. So this one was maybe unexpected, but based on the feedback from the community working group, we removed the recommendation to establish neighborhood liaisons. What we heard is that there's really a better way to um, build relationships with historic property owners rather than rely on one person in the neighborhood to be kind of the... Um, the avenue to convey that information. If a question, Marcy. Yes. One really short question. Was there like a vote for that? Was the, Do you know the outcome of that vote, if there was? Um, it wasn't a vote. It was more as we were going through the, the recommendations and looking at specifically community engagement of what's the most effective way to engage the community and specifically build relationships with owners of historic properties. And... Um, this uh, recommendation for neighborhood liaisons, we had one neighborhood liaison in one historic district and, and that person was on the working group and he said he felt um, kind of in an awkward position because he felt that the city should be the ones conveying information about the process and about guidelines um, and there is a better way to maybe have that be direct rather than through a representative. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then here's one. Um, about transitioning to electronic or over-the-counter reviews for some um, case types and then conducting an annual applicant survey so that we can um, have a better sense of how we can provide good customer service or great customer service. And then finally, um, with program operation, we added um, some detail to analyzing the effectiveness of the existing demolition ordinance, and that could be having an annual report, seeing how many cases come in versus how many are um, approved of, of potentially significant buildings, um, increasing the clarity of information we provide, and then assessing the code definition of what a demolition is. Others are coordinating existing sustainability and historic preservation programs. That was mainly to update the language to reflect the current programs um, that we have today in 2019. And then the last one is to pursue collaborative approaches to integrate preservation in other city operations. And this one um, came up because there were a few points of friction over the last five years with um, conflicting code sections like a hundred year old barn that encroached in the alleyway six inches. And rather than um, reacting to these as the, on a case by case basis, is there a way to integrate um, within different departments to get ahead of these um, issues that we now know about. Um, so that's kind of the very brief overview of the five-year update to the Historic Preservation Plan. We're here tonight for your consideration to accept the five-year update, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you for that. Um, questions? Yeah, um, in section 1-9, the establishment of an archeological program, you state that it's going to require significant staff time and resources. 
Do you have any estimate of what that staff time and resources will look like? I don't have a more specific um, estimate of what that would be. It would be a, a, a completely new program of um, to what we have now. Do you have any ideas? Yeah, well, I think it would really depend on uh, the scope of, you know, how far we went with an archaeological program. I think it would, we'd probably try and um, tackle it in s smaller steps, um, start by consulting archaeologists because neither Marcy or I are archaeologists, so we'd, we'd kind of want to find out more about that. Um, but significant means, I think, that through through development of a program, there would be some sort of a, a review mechanism. So um, it probably would would require some volunteer time from. You know, I'm not I'm not opposed to the concept, but I'm opposed to an open-ended concept that, that we can't quantify. Would would it be something that would come back to council at some point with an update if you were going to do it, an? It RTO? absolutely would. Yes. Okay. Yes. And I, and I think I, I would say that it probably would um, be best established through, you know, an ordinance or an amendment to the Historic Preservation Ordinance. Mary? Thanks for that, Marcy. Um, I have a question about the um, historic context reports and um, how would that happen and is that something that could be um, done? What I'm thinking about is that situation that happened last year where um, the process didn't allow for um, doing research in real time. Um, so I'm just wondering how the historic context reports would um, be created and what space would there be for any gaps that may still exist afterward that, afterwards that could address situations that come up in mm -hmm. real time? Uh, similar to the historic resource survey plan, which lays out the, um, it's more building specific, but it has what's already been documented and then provides a prioritization of um, potential areas in the future, and so a historic context um, piece could be equally strategic in saying, you know, in the next five years, here are the ones to prioritize, hire a consultant um, to then create those reports so that we have them as a, as a growing library over time, ideally rather than having a property come up and us realizing that there's a gap in the, in the history, but to get ahead of it. And our historic is that the only source material for um, determination of significance, or is are there other documents, uh, books? Absolutely. Okay. I think that um, the value of the historic context reports is that they can be very um, localized, and so you have a, a historian focusing on Boulder on a specific um, topic that would pull from newspapers and books and other sources, but would be specifically about Boulder. Okay, thank you. Other questions? So with that, we will <coughs> go to a public hearing. Yeah. I will. Um, I just wanted to bring up this issue with Marpa House that got me thinking about things I've been thinking a lot for a long time about historic preservation, and that is we, we preserve the exterior of houses, and the interior can look like New York City, you know? And to me, that's just kind of obscene. And, and also, there's the culture, and you describe that the culture is a concern of yours, the cultural resource. For example, Marpa House, was 40 years, 40 people, right on the hill, no problems, super efficient use of space. Bathrooms with cubbies, you know, the, like comparing it to, to the balsam next to the hospital, you know, and 20 bathrooms in, you know, a single lot, 
they're, they're very, and 40 people, you know, in one small space with really efficient use of kitchen and the whole thing. Um, I think that should be like something that would really latch onto as a value about Boulder for efficiency and would contemporary, considering contemporary situations of energy efficiency, especially. And asbestos is not the end of the world. Why aren't we connecting more, much more tightly with Boulder Green Building Guild and with Building Services Department and Planning and Development to see how, what the latest ways are to save these spaces from being demoed. Um, because we're absorbing these huge costs that aren't articulated in our, our community because there's, you know, you, because you can. You can just dig it all up, all the cement, all the ex, ex embodied energy that's lost in transporting heavy materials out, you know, and, and there are, there are people that have come before council on that hospital and said how you could redesign it for you know some homeless people or or low income people and with the the way the nurses stations were designed is ideal for that and there's other communities that have that have changed you know re repurposed really excellent repurposing of buildings and that should be <laughs> first in mind with our, our, our new history, the history that we're gonna look back on, you know, 100 years from now or 500 years from now on what Boulder did and how, how we reacted to climate change. Thank you, and Jamie Boyle. <clears throat> Hello, um, I don't have anything prepared. Um, I. Uh, I'm the interim executive director of Historic Boulder. Uh, I just wanted to say welcome. Uh, thank you guys all for your service to our city. Mary, I know I've had the chance to meet you before um, at our member party last summer. Um, I just wanted to com commend Marcy and James on their excellent work and to thank you guys for involving us in um, the sort of evaluation and redevelopment of the plan. Um, thank you, looking forward to working with everybody as much as possible. Thank you very much. With that, we will bring it back to council and I would ask for comments. I Mary. wanted to put a motion on the table. Go for it. All right. <clears throat> so I move that we accept the five-year update to the Historic Preservation Plan. Second. Second. <laughs> Adam got his first second. All right, <clears throat> Mary. So thank you, um, Marcy and James, for this and everybody that was involved. I think they're, these are great updates um, and um, a great improvement on a process that keeps evolving. So thank you. Adam? Yeah, I, I got to read almost all of it, and it was really, really excellent. And I just really appreciate the time you put in. You know, landmarking is such an important part of keeping Boulder Boulder, so uh, just really, really appreciative of all the work. Aaron. In, in addition to the, all the great work that you did, it's a very fine document. I just wanted to call out that I particularly appreciate the addition of focus areas on um, places of significance to indigenous peoples and underrepresented groups. So I was really glad to see those added. Thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> then I'll jump in and I will agree with what Aaron and Mary have said. It's very good work. Um, I especially like the way the memo laid out the changes so that you could quickly start with what's changed and then, you know, look at what you wanted to follow up on. So I appreciate that very much. Um, so we have a motion and a second, and this is a show of hands. So all in favor of approving the five-year update to the Historic Preservation Plan, raise your hand. It is unanimous. Great, thank you guys. Thank you. And if and anyone ever wants a tour, just let us know. Pick the area and we'll we'll tell you all about it. Okay. That's sure. great. So Tom, I think your next um, consideration of a motion. I will be brief. Um, we are asked, as I said earlier, with some frequency, particularly because of some of the, the policies of the current administration, a lot of cities around the country have sued. Uh, this is a case uh, involving a Ninth Circuit decision, uh, United States against Sineg uh, Smith, 
Uh, it involves a uh, federal statute, 18 U.S.C. 1324, which prohibits individuals from encouraging or assisting someone to remain or enter the country illegally if they uh, know or, re or um, recklessly disregard the fact that the person, what they're doing is illegal. The Ninth Circuit held that it violated the First Amendment because the word encourages includes all sorts of broad speech. Uh, the Ninth Circuit's the only court that's ever held that statute unconstitutional. I believe the Third and Fourth have upheld it. Um, the, uh, the United States government petitioned for certiorari to the United States Supreme Court. The court accepted certiorari. San Francisco is taking the lead for some cities in uh, supporting the uh, defendant in that case uh, against the United States government's actions. Uh, they have asked us to be one of the anchor cities in uh, drafting their amicus brief. They're going to then invite other cities to join. I, I would recommend that the city do so. Very good. Thank you. Um, anyone have any comments? Questions? Do we need a motion on this? I make up this procedure as we go. Uh, yeah, that would be helpful, yes. So moved. Okay, all in favor? You, would you like, all in favor? Raise your hand. All right, very good. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Um, and so next we move on to the CU South. Um, process check-in because we've had our call-ups. Well, while staff is coming up, I want to frame this up a little bit. So this is a process check-in, meaning that we're going to look at what the next steps are and what other agencies or, or bodies might be involved. We are also going to be seeing something on January 21st, I think, and something else in February. So staff will probably talk to us about a report they expect to get by the end of the year, and the placeholder for the 21st is to be able to learn about that report, so that's an update. And the time in February is for us to do a deep dive into the substance of what we've learned and what that might mean. And so, <laughs> bless you. So for this, to keep things contained for this discussion, we're gonna be focused just on process and just on what the next steps are to get us to the report at the end of the year, and then the discussion of that report in January, and then the deep dive of what does it all mean in February. So that's why we scheduled it for 45 minutes or less. And I'm not really sure which of these two amazing gentlemen is gonna start. But with me is Joe Tadeucci, who is the Interim Director of Utilities, and Phil Kleisler with the Long Range Planning Group. Um, they each have different aspects of the project, so I'll let you decide who goes first. Yes. Phil. Thank you, Phil Kleisler with the City's Comprehensive Planning Division. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Um, also in the audience, we do have representatives from the Open Space and Mountain Parks Department, as well as the Comprehensive Planning Division. And so again, this item is really a process check-in to update council on two of the um, primary, primary and highly in integrated components of the project. And so that would be the potential annexation of a roughly 300 acre site in South Boulder owned by the University of Colorado, uh, Boulder known as CU South, as well as a regional flood detention project <coughs> along the South Boulder Creek located on and adjacent to CU South. So this agenda item, as, um, as the mayor um, mentioned, is scheduled for 45 minutes and is really focused on process, really what's happening now and what to expect moving forward. And so what we'd like to do is spend just a couple of moments going over some of the background on the annexation, as well as the flood mitigation project prior to going into the next steps. A Little bit of background on the annexation piece, and this will kind of be a kind of a quick facts version of this, but the CU South was, I think as some of you know, the site of pretty extensive gravel mining up until the time when the university purchased it in 1996. Um, the city does own and manage open space directly adjacent to CU South, though on the CU South site currently, there is no protected open space. There is, however, pretty extensive informal recreational uses, which you've probably seen out there, informal dog walking, um, um, occasional cross-country skiing and so on. Um, in terms of development plans, um, there really is no hard development plans for the site right now. The university has indicated that if annexed within the next five years, they'll likely be seeing some activity, being the flood mitigation construction, some low impact recreational fields, um, maintenance and improvements of the existing trail system, particularly for their cross-country team. Um, as well as making some of enhancements to the existing recreational facilities, particularly the tennis courts, 
um, restrooms, locker rooms, and so on. Um, the university is underway or beginning a process for their update of their tenure update for the campus master plan, which they anticipate completing in 2021. Um, and then they would pretty much turn a corner um, and moved right into master planning specifically for the CU South site, which they would anticipate completing in 2023. Um, so just a couple of words, and, and some of this is not new information for some of the existing council members, but we thought it'd be nice to provide at least some context um, for the new council members who haven't seen these really nice slides that we have, that the others have seen. Um, annexations in general, um, you know, they're a legislative process to make geographical changes to municipalities boundary. And in Boulder, land can be considered, or land can be annexed into the city if it's consistent, if it complies with state annexation statutes and it's consistent with the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan, which is really the community's vision for future development and preservation in the Boulder Valley. Um, the major framework in the comprehensive plan that determines whether or not a site can be annexed is what's called the areas one, two, three map. And so that's what you see on the screen here with area one being generally within the city um, to accommodate urban level development and receive city services. Um, area two being oftentimes adjacent to the city and is eligible for annexation, but currently in the unincorporated county. And that's what CU South is designated as. And then lastly, area three is really the remaining land within the Boulder Valley um, that the city and county work pretty closely together to ensure that we preserve the rural uh, land uses and character in those areas. And so again, a, an initial zoning would be applied to any property annexed into the city of Boulder, and that zoning would be consistent with what's called the land use map in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. And that's what's shown on this slide for CU South. And so just leading into this, and this is the final um, uh, annexation piece is that after this university purchased the site in 1996, they did approach the city several times um, with the intent and request to examine the future land uses and have a discussion about what happens to the site in the future. Um, the city deferred those conversations until uh, a time in which we had a plan for the, south, uh, for the flooding along the South Boulder Creek um, uh, drainage way. In 2015, City Council accepted the um, uh, um, South Boulder Creek Flood Mitigation Plan, and it's at that point that we, in 2016, engaged the university and had a p community dialogue around the future of this site. Um, and so when we had that public process, one of the things we heard was there was a bit of uneasiness around <coughs> changing the land uses without having a better indication about what's gonna happen on the site. And so we did something I don't think we've ever done in the land use planning realm, which is we adopted um, uh, the CU South guiding principles and we actually incorporated that into the comprehensive plan. And so when you see those, those will indicate the desired uses long-term that we would anticipate for the site. <coughs> and it's generally done through a map-based approach. And so from a land use designation, as you see highlighted here, the parks, urban, other land use, primarily being the footprint to the original preferred option in that 2015 flood mitigation study, as well as some, um, um, uh, ball field use and recreational use where appropriate. Um, um, a, a large swath of open space, other land um, remain designated as such in the comprehensive plan, which is really an indication of the city's interest to preserve and protect those portions of the land. And then finally, the remaining portion of the site is designated public. And that's where we would anticipate the university's development taking place. Predominantly, we would anticipate housing um, um, for faculty, staff, graduate students, and non-first year students um, to facilitate more on-campus housing opportunities as well as some small-scale academic facilities. And lastly, um, the university did submit an annexation application earlier this year. Um, that, as well as city staff's response, is available on the project webpage, which you'll likely be seeing soon. What you'll see when you see that is um, a draft term sheet that has each of the guiding principles in the comprehensive plan along with where the university and the city currently stand, as well as a level of indication of whether or not we're aligned. So with that, that was our five minute introduction to the annexation land use history on CU South. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to Joe. Thank you, Phil. Um, before I start, I want to acknowledge uh, Kirk Vincent from our Water Resources Advisory Board, who's uh, in the audience tonight for this discussion. And so Phil just gave a background on the annexation, and in addition to that, the other 
um, underlying component of our process discussion tonight is the flood mitigation. Um, and so just starting with some, some grounding, uh, look at a photo here. This is the street flooding that occurred uh, during our last major flood in Boulder, which occurred in 2013. And this is Koala Drive in uh, South Boulder in a part of the area that would be protected from this type of flooding for the, by the flood mitigation project. And so, click one more time, okay, thanks. Um, so this slide shows the flood inundation limits from uh, some of the modeling work that we have done. This is the 100-year flood in South Boulder Creek, and if you see the diagonal line that kind of comes across from the bottom right part of the photo, that's US 36. At the bottom portion of the yellow oval, that's where Table Mesa Drive is and the park and ride. And so in that yellow oval, the flood mitigation project that we're talking about would basically protect those people and prevent that type of flooding from happening in the future for whatever um, level of flood we design for. So that's, that's really the crux of what we're doing here. And then this, this slide shows the, the general concept that we've been working on uh, given the most recent council direction. And this shows the, um, what's been referred to as variant one. It's the 500 year inundation limits. And one of the things that our design consultant is working on right now is bringing back information to us to show what the inundation limits would look like and the project um, footprint would look like for something less than 500 year, between 100 and 500. So that's some of the information that'll be coming to you early in 2020 and um, we're looking forward to seeing that. It'll be presented to our staff in a technical memorandum at the end of the year. And so we'll be planning to prepare that for council and have a discussion. So I, that is a super brief overview of the flood mitigation project and now getting into process and schedule. And so this slide shows the overall timeline and I know there's been a lot of discussion that this project's been taking a long time. Um, there have been studies going back to 2003 and um, we've been working on various studies all the way through 2017. Um, since 2017, we've been working on a concept design, um, narrowing in on alternatives that could move a project forward. Just looking forward from where we are today, a project of this complexity and magnitude often takes multiple years to both design and construct. So you could say that those year values on the top of the forward um, facing part can be penciled in, those could move. Hopefully we can do things faster than that, but um, it is gonna take a while. Our most recent major capital improvement project, the Carter Lake Pipeline, from the time we got approval um, through design, permitting, and construction was close to four years. So it does take some time. One of the questions leading up to tonight's presentation is where the um, environmental agencies and approvals and clearances come into the process. And uh, stay on that slide for just a second. And so typically that occurs when you have um, the project fully defined and you, and you know what it is. And, um, we would move forward with that. The staff and consultants often prepare those applications and, and go through it. And so in terms of when we could engage the agencies and Phil did a sneak preview of the next slide that shows who the agencies are, typically that would occur once the project is dis defined. We're close to that point, but we're not quite there yet. And so um, now you can go. Joe, to can I ask you a quick question? When you say defined, you've used the term in the past 30% design. Is that, are those the same thing? Yeah, um, depending on what, who the agency is, um, if it's something that involves an environmental impact, you have to have the project designed to the point that you know what the footprint is and you know what the disturbance limits are. 
And right now we're talking about something that could be a 100-year design or 500-year. That could change the length of the flood wall and um, other things that we just wouldn't be ready to submit those permit applications. Something like an application for um, approval from the state engineer, the, the design would need to be a lot further along than that. So it, it varies depending on who the agency is, but that's generally kind of that, that middle bar up there is when that occurs. So um, this slide shows the, the agencies that are involved and um, at the top uh, and that would have regulatory and permitting authority over the project at the top are some of the federal agencies in the lower left. Um, are the state agencies and the and the lower right are the local agencies. Fortunately, I am for your benefit. I am not the person to walk you through that process in detail. So I'm going to move on quickly from that slide. Um, Joe, I do have um, a kind of a general question about how these approvals happen. Are they? Are they? Is there an effort to? Um, make them as parallel as possible, or is is there by nature, do th some of them have to be serial? How does that process work? Generally with the federal agencies, and this is probably something, um, whatever I say wrong right now, we can correct during our February study session, but there will be a lead agency that, that takes charge and um, consults with all of the other agencies through a process. And so, it doesn't necessarily have to flow all together. One of the things that our, our team and our consultants will look at is just the, the regulatory requirements for approval times and, and notice and just sort of map that out on a schedule. So I think we'll be talking about that in more detail as, as we get into 2020. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So this, this slide um, shows the near-term timeline, and this is what we really wanted to focus on with you tonight, the kind of the crux of our, our presentation. If you think about the annexation process that Phil talked about and the flood mitigation and all those agencies and approvals and the public and the boards, it quickly gets overwhelming to Mary's question about how all those pieces kind of fit together. And we do have a very detailed project schedule for the flood mitigation project. That's multiple items that um, we're actually updating. Fortunately, we do not have to digest all of that tonight. And it's just really the near-term timeline that um, we're honing in on. And we're here tonight with this process update in November. I mentioned that our consultant is working on the alternatives for the concept analysis and bringing back to our staff and, and the boards and council, what that looks like for the various flood levels. So we'll be able to talk about that and some of the other elements of preliminary design like the geotechnical investigation. And so we're really ramping up for the study session with council in February of 2020 to kind of lay it out and kind of show the trade-offs of, of things and the inundation limits and the impacts um, and Phil will be able to talk about it and others about how that might uh, affect the annexation process. We'll want to be working closely with the university from now through the, all of the process shown on this slide um, to make sure we're bringing them along as well. What we would hope for from the council study session, I know council doesn't take action at study sessions, but just to get your feedback so that we can then do a public and engagement process and bring the boards along and hopefully bring this to um, a decision point in May where we could have absolute definition of what the project is and then be able to move it forward efficiently through the design and permit process. So that, again, is, is the crux of our presentation and, and what we wanted to show you tonight, what we're planning in the near term and get your reaction and feedback. So I have a question real quick, just about process. <clears throat> At CAC, I recall that there was a January placeholder and is, that, is, is it correct that that is the update so that we know what the report your consultant gives you? 
Yeah, that is something we put on, on the schedule as a potential progress update. If there, it may or may not be needed. If there's something that we think would be informative for council before you see the bigger picture, we would use that. I think it's intended to be a matters update. Thank you. Uh, Mark? Yeah, quick question. I'm, I'm a little confused about the process. Um, in the absence of having an understanding with CU as to what they're prepared to accept, how can we keep moving the concept analysis along uh, and, and go into public engagement? Well, Phil can probably speak more historically to the engagement process that we've had with CU, and, and he will be talking about a subcommittee that they participate in. Um, we do meet with them monthly and, and uh, just kind of sit down and go through some of the planning. And so we have been having discussions with them about the various options. The one that we're showing here and the one that council directed us to work on is not the university's preferred option, but they have indicated to us there is a version of this one that we showed that they believe they can work with. They're very interested in the in some of the cost components that go with that. So as I said, we will be working closely with them throughout this process with the hope that when we get to that May 2020, we have an indication from them that there's a workable project to go forward through the annexation. And one follow-up. You said that um, they proposed an annexation agreement and you responded to it. Have they responded to your comments yet? N no, they have not. Again, we have been m meeting with them on a monthly basis, um, and you know I think there's a lot of areas where there's alignment, and there's some areas that we have to work through. And again, it all kind of links back to those to the guiding principles that we had talked about. That um, we do list in the in our referral comments. You know, there are some pieces where we have some initial disagreement that we need to work through, um, and some of the things we can work through prior to May. Some of the decisions that we need to make are somewhat contingent on the flood concept, and so um, those will need to be made after May. Rachel. So when I'm looking at the near-term timeline, um, where it says concept analysis completed and then public engagement and then project defined, is that essentially the same place that we were at in August 2018? Like, are we picking a, a concept in the same way that we were picking one That'll be almost two years before that. So I, I haven't. I wasn't part of the process at that time, so I can't speak to where where we were with um, the university. That's possible, Douglas. I don't know if you can speak to that. What's it's? I don't, I don't mean it as so much with the university as as picking a, a flood concept, a, something to send to preliminary design, which we thought we had done in I think August 2018. I'm just asking, like, on that timeline, are we two years delayed, approximately? So, so again, Douglas can, can speak to it historically, but what I would say is one of the reasons that we haven't been able to move forward with the university is we have been stuck in kind of a do loop of going back through the alternatives. And so as a, as a project team, and I'll show you in a second what our team is, we have really worked hard at aligning ourselves around an option internally and trying to move this forward. So honestly, the, the, the history goes way back, and I don't know how constructive it is to, to recreate what happened and how we get here. We're really trying to focus on being clear in our communication and what the process looks like going forward and working that as a team as efficiently as we can. I appreciate that, and that you you have been in a loop that was not of you know your own making. But when we then look at the timeline going past that, I guess I just wanted to be clear if if we've sort of delayed for two years, and that that first when the slide that you showed was looking right across the street from my house on Koala, like we those of us who live in harm's way yep. take those two years health and safety very seriously. So I would like to look at ways to condense the timeline going forward because I, I think that we've we have eaten up a lot of time it, in this phase. We understand that. And the, the schedule I showed going forward is definitely in broad strokes at this point, and we will want to refine that as we 
as we were. Bob. I want to come back to Mark's point and just maybe add a, a point of clarification in response, Mark, because it's a really good question. Uh, first of all, I'm, uh, Cindy and I have been on the process subcommittee working with this team um, over the past few months to get us where we're at right now, and I think we're going to have a discussion. We do all of our committee assignments on December 3rd to see who wants to serve on the process committee going forward. But I do want to respond to, to, to Mark because I do have a little bit of information about this based upon my serving on the committee. Um, while Phil, Phil identified that there was there's six major issues effectively in uh, the annexation agreement that that the, um, that the, the university put forward, and they are working through some of the the issues. But the big one really is how much buildable land, um, and um, one of the reasons why this team is working on storm design and a couple of other variables is because CU has said we, we have a little bit of a bid ask. Quite frankly, the the, the variant that you saw up on the on the on the um, screen earlier um, provides about 99 acres of buildable land for CU, and CU has said that they want 129. So we have a gap of about 30 acres. And one of the things that we're, we're trying to bottom out here and trying to um, learn is whether we can close that gap, either entirely or partially, by some of the, the design work that the, and, and experimentation that these guys are doing. So to answer your question, that really, we do, we do have a pretty good idea, at least with respect to buildable acres, of what CU's request is. We may not be able to get entirely there, but the objective is to see how close we can get to that. There are some other issues that are independent of buildable land, but this is probably the biggest single one um, that's been a, been a blocking factor here. So if I could follow up on that, <clears throat> um, it seems to me like that's what staff is going to bring us. So I would say one of the differences between two years ago and now is it's not a variant one, variant two kind of thing. It's like how much detention would give CU how much land, right? And so it's this trade space. And it may be that we both have to give a little bit. We get less detention than we want and they get less land than they want and we make a compromise or a deal. And so I think what we hope to get um, <clears throat> from this concept analysis completed is the information about how to make that that trade-off, which is essentially the discussions with CU, as Bob referenced, but also how that trades with detention, because we may have to strike a compromise. And so I don't think it's the exact same that you're thinking about. I think it's further along, but it, I'm sure it's not as far as long as you'd like, but I don't think the questions we're addressing are the same questions we were considering two years ago. If I can pile on to that, Sam, one other learning that we've had over the past probably 12 months, maybe nine months, is from the uh, Colorado Department of Transportation. We didn't have a very clear idea until I think this um, <coughs> spring, maybe about nine months ago, about what they were gonna allow and what they were not going to allow. And, and, and Suzanne led the charge on that and bottomed that out. And so we have a very clear picture of that, which does affect a lot of what these guys are doing right now as far as the placement of the wall, impact of open space, and some other factors. And so that is, um, it's progress. I, we, we, we may not have been delighted with the answer we got, but at least we have an answer and we have some clarity. Do you want to go on with the <coughs> yeah. structure? And so I, I mentioned the um, working with the university throughout this process and uh, also this, this project structure. So one of the components of feedback that we've received from council and from the community is that it has not been clear how we've been managing this pro mm -hmm. project as a staff team. And so I just wanted to put this slide up there. It's kind of a simplistic view of how we're covering it. There's there's other components that aren't shown here. Um, but working really closely with our open space staff and, and the open space board has, has helped us get aligned um, in the way we're going forward with this. There are some color differences there. The, the two um, departments in the middle that are shown in red the reason I made that color um, <coughs> distinction is that the annexation process and the flood mitigation process are the two drivers of this whole project. And so um, the other departments and interests that are shown in blue, they wouldn't have anything to do here on their work plan if, if the, the planning work and the utilities work wasn't going forward. And so the role that I have been taking is kind of the spokesperson for the project and the overall coordination and, and just working to achieve that alignment. 
from not only our internal stakeholders, but um, <laughs> external as well. So I, I am certainly a, a point of communication for the council members as this goes forward. And that's how we're organized as a project team. <coughs> So I think our last slide, I'll turn it over to Phil yeah, and he'll, he'll talk about the process committee. Just a quick note that um, the council will be making a decision on December 3rd to reappoint members to the process committee for CU South. Um, this committee meets about once a month. It's a public meeting. We get about a dozen or so um, interested um, um, community members that come and speak during the public comment portion. Um, I would say, so this is a council initiated committee and I think from a staff perspective, we give it two thumbs up. It's been really helpful. Council Member Yates and Council Member, Member Carlisle were, were, had about six meetings uh, since their appointment in March. They've helped us um, um, develop a plan for how we're gonna approach engagement moving forward. And they've also helped us navigating the occasional kind of uh, sticky situation, a meeting approach and, and so on. And so it's been very helpful and we look forward to um, future meetings with the, with the, the new committee. That's, that concludes uh, all of our slides for the evening. Great, and so my question to you all is, what would you like from us around the process? Do you just wanna hear our feedback now? Uh, what, are you hoping to hear anything from us? If you have any feedback on, the, particularly on the slide that had the back, black background and the arrow showing what happens between now and May, that it would be great to hear that. Um, Otherwise, we're, we're getting ready for the February study session, and we'll really want to get some feedback from you then. Anybody? Aaron? Yeah, thanks for laying this all out, Joe. I appreciate it. I, I guess my, my one piece of feedback would be uh, a lot of it to, uh, to CAC, it just that um, you know, to, the, to the extent that we can either stay on this timeline or make it any sooner, like if it's the first meeting or the first study session in February versus the second, for example, or if it could go in late January. I just, from my personal perspective, I feel like this project is the highest priority for this council, um, given the amount of uh, health and the health and safety involved for all the downstream residents. So I would just ask that CAC, if, like if there's a potential conflict that comes up, you're like, oh, well, there's this other thing, so maybe we'll push the CU South meeting back a week or two, I'd say, please don't. Um, and let's really try to stick to this schedule uh, at, at, the, at the least. Rachel. Will you tell me if I'm going off process? And oh, sure. Happy <laughs> okay. to. Inviting. Um, so a couple questions that I have, uh, again, wanting to make sure that we're compressing and not expanding this timeline going forward. Um, one is that when you come in February, we have a really good indication of, of the dollars that'll be involved in, in this new variant one. Uh, my understanding is there may be more than we initially anticipated, so I would not want us to get farther down the line and, and not be on board with the dollars. Um, and number two, and I don't know what if this is coming from you or, or council, but I think CU has said that under this new variant, they would not be willing to do student housing. So I just wanna know like, when will that sort of discussion come in and, and, and would this, is that something that you're going to bring to us and is that gonna be in place by February, sort of what we know so that we can have a somewhat informed decision on, on if we move forward with this variant, that that some of the guiding principles might be demolished? And yes, then, it's not something we know right now, but it's something that I think that comment in particular about how that would, inf how a flood project would influence future uses is something we'd wanna know sooner than later um, because we would wanna talk about, open up that conversation. Okay, um, and, and so then another project partner is obviously OSBT, and I, I'm hoping that uh, Tom can update in February or now. He had said previously that um, disposal might not be required, and I just wonder when would that be something that council would consider if we wanted to. Thanks. On the last point, I mentioned the Carter Lake Pipeline, which is one of the recent big projects we did. That involved open space disposals as well. And that took place in that window of the kind of normal permitting process and really didn't have an impact on it. Well, I think my question is a little bit different. It would be whether we're not going to do a disposal. Yeah. yeah. The question is, council decides whether or not something's an open space use. And I don't remember the exact language, but there's language in the charter that talks about flood prevention. And you get to decide whether or not this is something that's appropriate open space use. And if it's not, then it has to be a disposal, and then that goes through the disposal process. 
And is your legal opinion the same that it would be a proper use of open space to do flood mitigation? I don't think I've ever given an opinion. That's that's a quick question for counsel. Okay. Anyone else? So I'll just make a comment to be clear what I've talked to um, <clears throat> and others have talked to um, staff about, which is what we're really hoping to get is some kind of continuum or sensitivity. So calling it 100, 200, 300, 400 isn't right because there's no definition for anything but the one and the five. But having a range of detention volumes that ranges from the 100 to the 500 and then understanding some idea of cost, number of people protected, um, land available by CU so that we can look at that and make a trade and have a discussion with CU because right now we have two endpoints and so we know the costs for those and we know the detention levels for those but what is there in between what's it look like because n neither number 100 or 500 is magic so I, I mean I guess I just feel like that's what we're hoping to get you know is some way to feel what that looks like and then work within that space. So I don't think, and I think another thing that varies is right, the flood wall design would, would change with the detention, but largely it's just about giving us and CU the information to have a, a thorough discussion. Bob. In addition to the, um, to the design work or the modeling work that you guys are doing um, right now, one other um, variable that we might be able to, to dial, um, we can talk about this in the meeting in February, is, is purely political, so it doesn't have to do with these guys, and that's where the OSO line is. The, the line was drawn, I don't want to say arbitrarily, but it was, was drawn without maybe complete information. And so getting back to Mark's good question, how do we get CU closer to, to where they're amenable to, to doing this? And that moving that line, um, which doesn't re really require any engineering work, um, could be a possible contributor. Are we finished here? I'll just make a comment. This is very helpful. And I think staying really engaged between here and May um, will keep the council and the community filled with information and happy that we're making progress. So thank you. I think there's a plan for the process, whoever's on the process committee to meet um, in December and January. Is that right, Phil? I don't know if they're scheduled yet. Um, but we talked, but, kind of talked yeah, about that conceptually monthly, so, yeah. so that they, between council meetings, there's a process committee that's meeting with staff on per periodically to, to, to make sure that things are moving along and we don't have any surprises. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Your final item is the National League of Cities invitation to participate. So I'm gonna address this item. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, about 10 days ago, Mayor Jones received a letter from the National League of Cities inviting the city of Boulder to participate in a cohort of five to seven communities that had been essentially selected by National League of Cities to work through their race, equity, and leadership program. What they intend to do is select these five to seven cities and in the next two months, by the end of January, help those communities work through a workbook that they have and learn how to strengthen our community's ability to sustain conversations in our community around racial justice and equity. Um, it, it is a great opportunity for the city to engage in, and we need to make a decision tonight about whether or not we want to accept that opportunity. The reason why we need to make it tonight is that uh, later this week, the National League of Cities is gonna be having its major meeting in San Antonio, and I believe, Bob, you're attending that? I'll be leaving in seven hours. Yep, and um, Deputy City Man Manager Tanya Anji, who you've met several times, will be making a presentation at that meeting with regard to the city's efforts um, to work on racial equity issues. They need to announce at that time who the cities are. So um, I hope that we'll choose to participate, and if so, the second thing that I need from you is the name of a council member who wants to be part of the city cohort to do this work. It will require some effort um, in the next two months. So there'll be two webinars, there'll be internal work that the city staff will be working on, but we would love the council member to be helpful. And then finally, there'll be a trip to Washington, D.C in late January to meet with the cohorts in the other cities. So um, I hope you will say yes, and please let me know if there's a council member that wants to participate. 
So thank you, Jane, for that. And I would just like to um, say that I would support it. And the reasons would be that it aligns very closely with what a lot of work that's already happening. Um, there is um, a small committee that's meeting right now to um, figure out a um, community engagement um, plan for our racial equity plan that is in process as well. So um, what this work involves is very much aligned with work that's already happening. So, um, and then I would like to ask council if they, um, I've been serving on the um, GARE subcommittee for is it two years now? Um, a year and a year half. And, a half. Um, and um, so I would ask council to, um, I would be interested in, in being that council member. Anyone else? Aaron. Well, I, I absolutely support this for the same reasons that Mary stated, so I won't go on anymore. And I'll just say that, Mary, I will absolutely defer to you. This has been something I would love to do, but you're by far more qualified, so I totally support you. Any other comments? I just want to make an observation about National League of Cities. Um, it, it's an organization, and we'll talk more about this in December, but it's an organization that's got about, about three or 4,000 city members. So it's a pretty big, it's, it's, the, it's the organization for elected officials and mayors throughout the country of cities of all size. And Boulder has um, really punched above its weight um, with the National League of Cities. Of course, Matt Applebaum was on the board of directors of the, of the national board. Uh, Sam and I serve on um, two of the major committees um, Tanya will be presenting um, later this week um, on race and equity. This, this invitation was obviously quite an honor for us, and they identified us as, as being an appropriate city. And then our own Judge Cook um, is actually the head of an organization that she has created with other municipal judges around the country um, to create a municipal judges association, and they're hoping, she, Judge Cook will be in San Antonio this week as well, hoping to put that under the umbrella of National League of Cities. So it's something that um, the city, I think it's a good investment by the city. We get a lot out of it from the standpoint of, of networking and understanding best practices across the country. And when we meet on December 3rd to talk about um, committee assignments, I think Sam and I will encourage others of you to consider participating and getting involved in National League. So there's no limit to the number of representatives we can have. So. Uh, and there's a, there's a whole lot, a lot of topics to tackle. So I, I just want to put in a plug for our particip our continued participation in National League of Cities. Okay. So uh, everyone give a thumbs up if you want to do this. All right, we're all good. So Jane, I think you have the green light for this. Okay, so we're down to the debrief. And what this is in the meeting is when we bring up just process questions or feedback um, like Sam, you did a terrible job. That's fair game, but you should tell me that later. Um, <clears throat> I have a few things, but, and they're just kind of. You want to ask if other people want to? Yeah, I was going to ask. That's what I was going to ask first. Um, so does anyone have any feedback on how the meeting went? Or, yeah. I, I thought you did a good job of baby stepping us through some of the process at a couple points. So I appreciated that as a first timer. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Any other feedback on the organization of the meeting? I'd have to say after one meeting, I'm excited about this new council. Yeah, good, me too. So I just have a few small things I'm gonna mention. Um, Mayor Pro Tem is a one-year term. So for those of you who are interested in learning about leadership and what it means to sit on CAC, you know, every Monday for a year, <clears throat> um, I would have you start thinking about that now because come this time next year, we will make uh, an appointment of a new person. So think about if that's something that you'd wanna do. And typically we try and pick somebody who hasn't done it before. So Mary's done it, I've done it, uh, Aaron's done it, and now Bob's going to do it. So for the rest of you, just be thinking about that because we're always looking for folks to do that. And I will just add that I did it my oh, second yeah. year. That's right. I did it my second year, so. Yeah. Um, socially responsible investing, we got an uh, information packet about how the organization is using its deposited funds in a socially responsible way. I just want to say thumbs up to that, Jane. Thank you. And I wanted to call it to everyone's attention if you didn't happen to catch it. I just got it in the um, bookmarks. The next meeting, December 3rd, we will be doing um, our committee assignments. We're trying to do that before the retreat so that we don't miss any um, important meetings. So please be thinking about what you would like to do on that and you know have a read through what the descriptions are and so on. 
Um, and the last thing is, this is just like a, a tip about how we often try and get everybody caught up when we're talking and making a point, is referencing the PDF page number can help us get there really quickly. So if there's a way, I mean, I don't know if the Nova system has, I think what I experienced is I didn't download the entire PDF, which is why we had different issues with page numbers. So I can show you exactly where that is because I figured it out mid-meeting. And um, we get an email with the link that goes directly to it. So you can just click on the link and click on the PDF and get the whole thing. So if we all have the same PDF, then we all have the same, you know, we can get there quickly. Well, so Sam, I just said the uh, things are a little different now because the, the uh, full PDF no longer has the internal bookmarks for finding all the different saw that, yeah. bits, which to me I, is incredibly useful. And so you have to get the individual packet items now to get the bookmarks for each of the sections. What? And yeah, yeah, and 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 I, I when you have a, a like a, something like the building code that's like two hundred odd pages long, I think those internal bookmarks are oh, yeah. very very handy. So I, I I'm, I'm still adjusting this, but what I'm finding is I'm downloading the individual PDFs. Um, so we might end up. I think we just need to be clear. You if you refer to either the individual PDF page number or the total packet page number, which one you're doing. So what you're referring to, Aaron, is the the sub drop where you could go to a bookmark and then have the bookmarks underneath that. Right, like if, if you have yeah. the initial item okay. and then appendix. Yeah, yeah. I noticed a, that. Attachment B. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I noticed that. And, and I do, I rely on those. Yeah, so do I. So Lynette, is there any way that we can have the um, large PDF, the full packet PDF have the sub bookmarks? So if you go in through the HTML version, if you don't download the full PDF, if you go in through HTML, those do maintain those secondary bookmarks. And what we've also added to um, those attachments is a footer on the left side that is item page number. So regardless of what format you're looking at, you can all be referring to the same page number of each item. So, so but Lynette, the, that doesn't have the total packet page number. So it's like HTML the page number does within. not. Right. And so, so if somebody's looking at the whole packet versus the individual item, they're going to be different page numbers. Well, you'll still have that page number on the left, which should be consistent throughout every format. So, so let, let me ask this question. If you have the individual oh, PDFs, okay. can't you just use a tool to roll it up into one PDF and maintain all the bookmark information and the page numbering? One more time. Okay, so you've got your individual PDFs for the, the agenda items. Um, I know there are tools, I've used them, where you just append PDFs onto each other and then save it as a final file so that you would have the entire packet with the full set of bookmarks that were in the individual PDFs. I can talk with you about it offline. It, it was just very convenient in the past to have the PDF that had the full bookmarks, and we would all just refer to one page number, and we could get there. I, I will note we did we did get an item, an email about this from from the city clerk's office that I think it took a, a number, many extra hours to do that the way they were doing it before, and so this was a process improvement that they were doing to be more sustainable within their office, which I support. Um, so, but if there's a quicker, if there's a quick way, if there's some like way you could do something in ten minutes to roll it all up, that'd be great. I think there is a possibility, so I'll, I'll talk to them about that. Okay, that was all. Any other final thoughts? So I have just one question for Lynette along these lines. Um, so you sent out an email saying that we could get trained on this new system, mm -hmm. and um, <coughs> do we have any dates set? For? We don't, I'm going to revisit that starting this week. I haven't okay. gotten back to that. So, okay, great, thank you. But if there's a time you all would prefer that I can look into. You had mentioned, I think, right before a meeting. Yeah, I suggested um, right before meetings because okay. we're here anyway, yep. and it's always easier. It's nodding. Okay, yeah, I'll look into that. We're also doing a Friday focus on preparing for council meetings for the new council members and the old council members are invited, and I thought that was something we could discuss during that session as well because uh, accessing the packet's a big part of preparing for meetings. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Okay, with that, I'll note that we're half an hour early and the meeting's adjourned. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs>
live from Paris, en France 24.